Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 23rd meeting of the Berkeley Unified School District Board of Education. Ms. Barrios, can you please open this up? Sure. Good evening. El siguiente mensaje será repetido en español. I would like to provide a brief overview of tonight's meeting. After a few procedural items, the board will hear 30 minutes of public comment. At the end of the meeting, there will be another and final opportunity for additional public comment. So if you do not get to speak at the beginning of the meeting, you can stay and speak at the end. To participate in public comment, please raise your hand now by clicking on the participants button at the bottom of your screen and selecting the raise your hand. To comment by phone, you'll be prompted to raise your hand by pressing star nine. If you wait to raise your hand until public comment period starts, you will not get to speak and you'll have to wait until next public comment period. When called upon, you'll be promoted to a panelist. This means that you will appear, appear on screen. If you do not wish to appear on, on camera, please be sure to disable your camera on your end. The board president will usually call on our students first. So if you are a student who wishes to speak, please write student or S at the end of your name. The board president will determine to, whether to set tonight's speaking time at one, two or three minutes per speaker. On an indiv individual basis, she also has the discretion to allow for extra time for those who need translation or have other special needs. When your time has elapsed, you'll see Vice President Babbitt holding a sign letting you know you have 15 seconds left. If you're still speaking, you are allowed to finish your sentence, but please try not to speak beyond your time. Thank you. Voy a proporcionarles un resumen detallando el orden de esta reunión. Después de unos procedimientos preliminares, un periodo de 30 minutos será dedicado a comentarios públicos. Al final de la junta, que usualmente puede ser cerca de las 10, habrá una segunda y última oportunidad para quienes desean participar en comentarios públicos de parte de miembros de la audiencia que no tuvieron la oportunidad de proporcionar comentarios durante el primer periodo de comentario público. Para comentar por videoconferencia, a favor de levantar la mano ya haciendo clic en el botón participantes en la parte de abajo de la pantalla y selecciona el botón levantar la mano o raise your hand. Para comentar por teléfono, levanta la mano presionando estrella 9. A favor de hacerlo ya, ya que si se espera hasta el inicio del periodo de comentarios públicos, tendrá que esperar hasta el final de la reunión para participar. Usualmente la presidenta llamará a los estudiantes primero. La presidenta de la mesa directiva otrará uno, dos o tres minutos por orador y tiempo adicional a quienes requieren traducción o otra adaptación especial. Al ser llamado serán promocionado a panelista y aparecerá en pantalla. Si no desea de aparecer en pantalla, por favor de apagar su cámara. Cuando le faltan 15 segundos, la vicepresidenta Babe le hará saber levantando un cartel. Si sigue hablando cuando se acaba el tiempo, puede terminar su oración, pero por favor trate de no sobrepasar su tiempo. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. I will now officially call this meeting to order at 7.08 p.m. Ms. Barrios, can you please call the roll? Student Director Anjuna Mascareña Swan. Director um, Julie Sinai. Here. Director Ty Alper. Here. Director Anna Vasudev. Here. Vice President Laura Babbitt. Here. President Khadija Brown. Present. Thank you. Well, you will now move to the action item to approve the agenda. Um, is there a motion to approve this evening's agenda? Is there an item to be removed? Uh, are there any items that need to be removed? Yes, thank you very much, President Brown. Um, I'd like to uh, withdraw item 12.19. Uh, thank you so much. Um, are there any other items that need to be taken from the agenda? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the agenda with the necessary corrections? I'll move that. Moved by Director Alper, is there a second? I'll second. Second by Director Vasudev. Is there any unreadiness? Hearing none, Ms. Barrios, can you please uh, use the roll for the vote? Student Masca Ma Andrea Mascareña Swan? Yes. 
Director Sinai? Yes. Director Alper? Yes. Director Basudev? Yes. Vice President Babbitt? Yes. President Brown? Yes, thank you so much. This evening, I am excited to introduce to you all uh, something that we have on our agenda, which is our equity showcase. Um, as you all know that as a part of our ongoing work in the district to showcase the efforts um, of our district and of specific school sites, um, the board has adopted these equity showcases. Uh, we began with our first equity showcase with Longfellow. We had an equity showcase um, for our uh, visual and performing arts department. And now this evening, I am excited to welcome Willard Middle School, who will give um, their equity showcase on the incredible and extensive work that they are doing for their middle school students. I had the pleasure of having a tour of Willard uh, last uh, yesterday, just yesterday. Um, and I had a, pr a personal tour for our, from our great principal. And I met wonderful students who were engaged, excited, um, and happy to learn. And I met wonderful uh, staff members who were also excited, engaged, and happy to, to teach and support our students. And so I got a glimpse of the amazingness that is happening at Will Willard uh, Middle School. And I know that you all will enjoy the glimpse that you will get this evening. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Chris Albeck, who will give us our equity showcase about Willard Middle School. Welcome. Thank you, President Brown. Berkeley community, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Christopher Albeck. I'm the proud principal of Willard Middle School, and we are very excited to share with you all a little bit about the equity work that Willard has put in to making STEM an accessible uh, program for all of our students. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Stevens, panelists, and community. My name is Tamar McKee, and I'm a proud eighth grader at Willard Middle School. I'm here today to read BUSD's mission and value statements. The mission of Berkeley Unified School District is to enable and inspire a diverse student body to achieve academic excellence and make positive contributions to our world. The values and beliefs of the Berkeley Unified School District are, number one, student Uh, Chris, you have Ms. to Adios, we And number four. Can, can, can you go back a bit, Chris? And act with integrity. Thank you, and have a great meeting. The values and beliefs of the Berkeley Unified School District are, number one, students are our priority. Number two, we take pride in our diversity. Number three, we hold high expectations for ourselves and our students. And number four, we treat each other with respect and act with integrity. Thank you, and have a great meeting full of BUSD's four E's, excellence, equity, engagement, and enrichment. Good, good evening, board members, super. Thank you, Ms. Tamar McKee, an absolute standout and ready for Berkeley High School. Here's the statement of our equity issue. In our nation, access to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, better known as STEM, careers and education pathways are inequitably distributed along the lines of income, race, ethnicity, and gender. As Berkeley Unified School District, we observe trends of disproportionate enrollment among education pathways that lead to STEM-oriented fields. An example of this is the stark underrepresentation of students of color and women at Berkeley Unified School District's computer science pathways. With this, Berkeley Unified School District has invested in a robust middle school STEM program that supports the vertical alignment of Berkeley High School STEM offerings. It is with this investment that Willard Middle School and Berkeley Unified School District intend to disrupt patterns of inequity in hopes of supporting all of our learners access high quality science education. And next, you'll hear from some of amazing Willard educators on what this actually looks like. Good evening, my name is Debbie Lenz, and I'm one of the STEM teachers at Willard. We started developing our STEM elective program in the spring of 2019, and we are now in our third year of classes. We began with our sixth grade wheel and year-long seventh, eighth grade elective in our first year. 
Due to its popularity, we added an advanced STEM class for eighth graders in our second year. This current year, we also added an after-school makerspace open lab. We created a program that is hands-on and project-based to introduce students to real-world applications of both design and technology. Every project builds in student choice and artistic creativity. Through this program, we hope to expose more students to STEM fields through high interest and exciting projects, especially those students who are traditionally underrepresented in these fields in the adult workforce. We are using both BCEP funds and CTE grant funding to purchase equipment and fund some staffing positions. We are excited at the future prospects for this program as it grows and develops. Hi everyone, my name is Claire Matrician and I'm the instructional specialist at Willard in the Makerspace. The universal sixth grade STEM class is a nine week course taught as one part of the elective wheel. The class addresses equity issues by giving all sixth grade students a fun and engaging experience in STEM where they get to collaborate on various hands-on or technology-based projects. The course content was designed with Berkeley High School CTE program in mind, with each unit tied to a different career pathway, such as digital media, engineering, and computer science. The five units we cover in the class are engineering design, coding, robotics, 3D modeling and computer-aided design, and video production. Our North Star for the program is to capture the interests of a diverse group of students while they are at a young age and give them a positive experience in various STEM fields. After sixth grade, students then begin picking their own electives for the first time. Hi, my name is Moonjay Kim, and I am a STEM and science teacher at Willard. Uh, the STEM elective class is a year-long course offered to both seventh and eighth graders who are interested in further exploring the areas they, they sampled in their sixth grade wheel class. The year long format gives students a longer amount of time to dive more deeply into topics, as well as explore their specific interests more intensely. We cover a wide range of fields through different projects, including coding, uh, CAD, 3D modeling, engineering design, electronics, digital media, media production, uh, which includes audio, photo, photo and video, uh, website and uh, graphic designs, as well as robotics. In the future, we hope to add units in the areas like carpentry, alternative energy, and virtual reality. The hands-on and exploratory ex approach to learning is very um, engaging for our students. Uh, the demographics in this class will be a good metric to determine how uh, effectively we are reaching a, a diverse group of students with this program. Students in the advanced STEM class have already taken the sixth grade STEM wheel and the year long STEM elective in seventh grade. This class creates a space for those students who have really connected to the content to dive even deeper into these strands, to build on what they learned before and to take on more challenging projects. They learn higher level coding using more complex robots. They learn how various machines operate and then build working models using hydraulics, mechanical, and 3D printed parts. They learn how to code the kinds of apps we use on our phones and tablets, like texting or gaming or academics. These students have also gotten a chance to be technology leaders in the school. They helped AVID students participate in an hour of code activity. They worked with the special ed department to create learning programs for our ESN students to practice things like street crossing safety and buying things in a store. These students are likely to continue in these fields in the future. We just started our after school makerspace program this year and it has proved very popular. It happens four afternoons a week and students can participate either as a part of learns or in a drop in basic basis, making it universally accessible to all. It is organized in an open lab style where students choose what they make from day to day, whether it is for one of their classes, like modeling a 3D animal cell, or just something that they want to explore for fun, like puzzle making. Projects range from coding games to digital music production to even finger knitting. They can choose to participate in technology or craft-based workshops offered each week as well. We have been collaborating with after school clubs like Latinx or GASA on projects relevant to their club missions. We have also been collaborating with classroom teachers to bring STEM into their curriculum. 
with 3D printed mummies in history classes and website design in the ambassador's leadership class. We are pleased to see that the demographics of students participating in this after school program are fairly closely representative to our school's entire population in terms of gender and ethnicity. Let's hear from some of our amazing students. The first one is a representative of the sixth grade STEM wheel. Go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Anijah Johnson. I'm a sixth grader at Willard Middle School. So Anijah, you had the STEM elective wheel for sixth graders? Yes. And what was that like for you? It was fun. I learned a lot of new things, got more creative. Nice. What was one of the projects that you remember? Uh, the one with the robots. Yeah, tell me more about that. What did you guys have to do? It's like, okay, we had computers and then like, it was like a whole like setup thing on how you, by what you want your robot to move by. Mm -hmm. And then it was like a little robot. <clears throat> and it was like, you either had a controller type. Right. Or you controlled off the computer with the keys. Nice. So the robot can move forward, backward, turn, do little tricks. Yeah. And how did you make it move? What did you have to do? Uh, we had, I forgot what the, the web was called. Uh huh. But it was like, we had, you know how like the keyboard? Uh huh. And then we had like, it was like a whole category inventory. Oh, wow. Of, if you wanted to move forward, backwards, and which keys control for it to do that. Wow. Had you ever done anything like that before? No. Oh, wow. But I learned how. Nice. And what do you think about STEM? Is that something that you're interested in doing or thinking about in the future? Honestly, yes. Mm. What, what, kind of, what kind of things would you like to learn more about when it comes to STEM? I would like to learn more about, like, the electronics, the robots and stuff, right and, on. like, coding. You like coding as well? Yeah. Right on. Thank you, Nigel. And a representative of our seventh, eighth grade STEM elective. Hi, I am Lila Montoya. I am in grade seven. Hey, Lila, what attracted you to STEM? I was really interested in building things, which the like tutors said that that was what we would be doing in STEM. What has your experience been like in STEM this year? It's been really good. I've been very satisfied with the like what we've been doing in STEM. It was very fun and like did include building things. What's been your favorite unit? I really liked the house modeling unit where we printed out uh, blueprints of houses and made them into actual cardboard 3D models. Excellent. And what do you see yourself doing in the future, Lila? Possibly architecture because I'm so drawn to creating things. And do you feel like STEM has helped support you with that? Interest? Yes, definitely. Would you recommend STEM to other kids? I would. It is like it, it like so creative like it invokes a lot of imagination i believe all right thanks lila welcome and lastly a representative of our eighth grade stem wheel hey introduce yourself um i'm sachin i'm an eighth grader and i'm in advanced stem so, uh, yeah so sachin what what attracted you to stem um i just like i like a lot of the subjects that they sort of teach and it's really fun and it's really interesting and they're kind of useful things that you can learn in, in, in it and yeah it's just it's a fun class and you kind of get to explore like what you can do with different kinds of things that i never would have thought of before amazing tell us your favorite part of stem so far um i think there's been some really cool engineering things like we did like making paper airplanes and seeing how far certain designs went and also we made uh cardboard machines that you like twist something and it does something and it's pretty cool Excellent. um yeah so we're just like there's like a lot of like problem solving and i think that's really fun just to figure it out like, wow get through it do you see yourself taking stem or like computer science classes at the high school um yeah probably because it it's super fun and it's kind of useful um and i think that especially like the engineering things uh can be really fun to do and really just interesting like how to make like some sort of robot and how to program it to do a certain thing and like how that can be used to like make things and yeah that just, that stuff just interests me a lot and it i think it's cool how we can figure out things and make them happen sort of <laughs> nice thank you Sachin. all right and thank you berkeley unified school district for supporting our program and supporting willard uh, it goes a long way and we deeply appreciate it have a good evening
Thank you so much, uh, Principal Albeck. Thank you for that incredible presentation. Thank you for all of the work that you are doing over at Will Willard. And please, on behalf of the board, give our appreciation and congratulations to Willard, uh, your students, your faculty, your staff, and your families for uh, continuing to be shining stars. So thank you for being here and have a good evening. And next we will report out from closed session. Vice President Babbitt, can you please give the report? Sorry, good evening, everyone. Closed session began at 6 p.m. All members were present. Um, and for item 3.1, we heard an update and gave direction. And for item 2.1 and 2.2, uh, we also discussed. And that uh, ends the report out. Thank you, Vice President Babbitt. Uh, we will now move to our first opportunity for public, uh, public comment. As Ms. Barrios explained in her uh, opening remarks, if you are interested in making a public comment this evening and you are a student, please put S or student in front of or behind your name so that we may give you the priority to speak. And if you are interested in speaking tonight, you can now raise your hand using the raise hand function on Zoom. I'll give everyone a couple of seconds to go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and as you are doing that, we will, um, Vice President Babbitt set the speaking time tonight to three minutes. We have 21 speakers. And so we will begin a public, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll set it to one minute. The speaking time for everyone is one minute. Sorry, everyone's heart dropped on the screen. But we'll set the speaking time to one minute uh, because we have 20, now we have 20 speakers. So we'll begin our public comment uh, speaking time with no student speakers right now. So we will begin with um, Yvette Falarka and our last public speaker uh, for this evening will be Lada. Okay, Ms. Barrios, can you please uh, promote Yvette Falarka? Again, each of you all have one minute to speak. That is such a short amount of time. So please do us a favor um, and condense your speech right now if you can, so that when your one minute comes up, uh, we don't have to politely inter interject. Um, so please go ahead um, and govern yourselves according to that, um, that direction, okay? Ms. Falarka, whenever you are ready, we will go ahead and begin. Welcome. Thank you. Yvette Falarka, virtual only teacher in BIS's K-8 program. This district is trying to gut the online education program, rendering a virtual option as empty words. The virtual academy is being cut and all virtual only teachers are slated to lose our online teaching positions. The relationships and bonds that we teachers, students and families have built together in this program should not be torn apart. We're committed to each other and to our program. I want and need to stay online and I know families who do too. Claims that our program and our teachers are too expensive are similar to claims made when school districts don't wanna spend money on services for students with disabilities or English learners. These decisions are always questions of priorities. With new variants already spreading and COVID surging again, Restoring the virtual academy and keeping all the, all the online teachers needs to be Berkeley's priority for the fall. Thank you for being here, Ms. Falarkin, for your comments. Next, we will go to Ann Song, followed by Monica Reedy. Uh, Monica Reedy. Good evening. I'm a parent of a first and sixth grader attending the BIS virtual ed program. Please do not cut this wonderful program. It has been invaluable for families such as my multi-generational household with medically fragile members. I've been so impressed with the level of dedication and quality of education. It is very different from the standard BIS program, which has one-on-one -on -one weekly meetings and in-person electives. The K-5 through virtual ed program meets daily in addition to two small groups twice a week, and the middle school program has two weekly Group meetings on top of their one-on-one -on -one with their teacher. There are no virtual electives. Ms. Falarka and Ms. Jenkins have worked hard to foster a rich online learning community, keeping my family safe while also allowing my children to flourish academically. They are eager to attend their group meetings, which give them an opportunity to interact virtually with their peers. I urge BOSD to continue the virtual ed program for the upcoming school year. Thank you. 
Thank you. We'll go to Monica, followed by Phyllis Davis. Hi, my name is Monica Reedy. Um, I'm a parent of three children in Berkeley Unified. Um, my oldest just graduated from BHS last year, and she was completely virtual for the entirety of the pandemic. Um, I have an incoming kindergartner who I'm intending to enroll in virtual only education in BUSD if the program remains adequately staffed. If not, I'll be forced to pursue a charter or just file a PSA and be my own homeschool. Um, so obviously I'm in support of retaining all the virtual only teachers in Berkeley Unified. Um, we work this year with Dinah Macy. She's my fifth grader's teacher. She's wonderful. My fifth grader looks forward to meeting with her every week. Last year, we met with Anna Martinez for fourth grade, who was also amazing. Both Anna and Dinah are such assets. I never thought as a single parent that I could be a homeschooler. <laughs> and with the support of Dinah Macy and Anna Martinez, I have felt completely able to do that. Um, with all the unknowns of the pandemic, and I also have a multi-generational household with some at-risk members, I have zero intention of sending my children into a classroom, especially when masks aren't required. Thank you, Ms. Reedy. I'm so sorry to cut you off, okay, but thank just you to finish for, the for being sentence, here in your comments. Please keep BUSD's virtual only teachers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis Davis followed by Katie Davis. Hi, I'm Phyllis Davis, and I'm a parent of two virtual students at BIS. Two weeks ago, the district said that the virtual program costs $500,000 and that there are 20 students in the program. Here are the real numbers. There are 42 students in the K-5 virtual academy. There are 36 students in K-8 virtual homeschool. This is a total of 78 students. The state of California gives BUSD $14,174 per student. Multiply that by the 78 virtual program students and you get $1,105,572. If the virtual program really costs $500,000, then with more than $1 million, the virtual program can fund itself. Please renew the virtual only teacher contracts and virtual positions now. Keep the K-5 virtual academy open and please keep the virtual K-8 homeschool program open with the existing teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we will move to Katie Davis followed by Diamond Macy. Uh, the school board is letting go virtual only teachers and stripping the virtual program that I and many others use to stay safe in the time of COVID. I started my seventh grade school year in person, but the Omicron cases rose across the country. I became very concerned. There are two immune suppressed members in my family. My days are filled with crowded hallways and classrooms, no chance to social distance, even though there were signs around the school reminding us to stay apart. To protect my family, I made the decision to switch to the virtual program. My classes are all online and the quality of my education has improved because of the one-on-one -on -one style of teaching. The school board is going to strip the program. There are more than 70 students in the program and many of them are medically fragile. This program gives them the chance to go to school in a normal way. School districts and those in charge can say to socially distance to keep ourselves safe, but there's no way to do it. There's no room, there's no enforcement. There was even an email sent out that saying if I was attending in person, we can only assume that I was exposed to COVID. Virtual program, virtual only teachers have helped me stay safe and kept my family safe. Why take them away? Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you for your, for your comments this evening. If there are any other students who, are, uh, who wanna speak tonight, we wanna give you all priority. So please put S or student before or after your name so that we can give you priority. At next, we will have uh, Dinah Macy followed by Tasha Jackson. Hi, my name is Dinah Macy and I'm the K-5 assisted homeschool teacher who meets with students and families virtually. I'm here to join the argument that BUSD must maintain the virtual programs next school year. It's been a lifeline for participating educators, families, and students. I'm virtual because I have a lung disease, which makes me more vulnerable to COVID-19, and I've been grateful for the ability to continue teaching without having to compromise my health. All students I meet with have continued to receive a quality education with the necessary supports to do so, and I'm continuously impressed with the skills students have developed this year. BUSD is keeping the option for students to learn virtually, but will not commit to return, retaining the virtual teachers. In order for BUSD to continue to offer a respectable virtual program, it needs to remain vested in us, the virtual educators. As educators, it's our job to ensure that every student has access to a quality education, continuation of the virtual academy, and virtual assisted homeschool is essential to achieving this. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next, we'll have Tasha Jackson, followed by Jessica. Good evening. My name is Tasha Jackson, and I am co-professional development coordinator, Mr. Max Wheeler at Berkeley High. I am the social studies teacher at the service. Ms. Jackson, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but we're having a little bit of trouble uh, hearing you. There's some feedback. Do you want to maybe adjust your sound and try, try again? Okay, thank you. That's okay. Yeah, we'll keep going. So we'll actually go ahead and promote uh, Jessica. And as soon as Jessica's comments are over, we will go back to you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Barrios, can you please promote Jessica? Thank you. Hi, Jessica. Welcome. Hi there. Thank you for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Jessica, I'm current parent, parent of a greater BIS student. Next year, I will be a parent to, to a sixth grader and an animator, hope, hopefully in the same program. Um, I'm here, here to join the discussion and the argument that the BS, BUSD really needs to keep the virtual academy and the de dedicated Hi, Jessica, you paused um, for a second as soon as you finished the sentence that ended with dedicated. Jessica, can you hear us okay? We'll give Jessica a few seconds. Um, Tasha, we'll go ahead and go back to you. And then Jessica, whenever you come back in, we'll jump back in with you. Go ahead, Tasha. So sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Hi, so as you know, I'm Tasha Jackson. Um, I am co-professional development coordinator at Berkeley High along with Mr. Max Wheeler. I'm also a social science teacher in the Academy of Medicine and Public Service, and I am a BUSD parent. I am coming to you tonight to share in the urgency that you hire a superintendent that not only prioritizes anti-racist education, but demands it in our schools. Mr. Wheeler and I will be following up with a longer letter to you, our board, that has a detailed data analysis of the success of anti-racist and gender expansive PD support in our schools. We ask for your careful attention to this in the superintendent search. Our anti-racist work helps us tend to the needs of the most underserved vulnerable students. The data which Mr. Wheeler and I are compiling in a comprehensive letter speaks to this truth. I ask you to create the same expectations the next superintendent has that we have with our teachers. Those expectations include creating anti-racist policies in our classrooms and on campus, removing bias when interacting with our students and families and working toward eradicating white supremacy culture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jessica followed by Trina Blackman. Jessica, if you are with us, you can go ahead and unmute for your public comment. Hi there, I'm bad at, can you hear okay? A little bit better, yes. A little bit better, okay, I'll be quick. I just okay. really, really want to give a final out to my daughter's two dedicated teachers. We have, we're working currently with Miss Yvette Bet for Larka and Mr. Ted Lee, and their teaching has, has been outstanding. My child has arrived. She's so happy to see them every day. They they fully engaged. Um, always having having wonderful projects. I just, just we don't know no again would do without it. Without it, They're amazing. Please please keep them. Thank thank you. Thank you and thank you for hanging in there with us during your uh, technology challenges. We appreciate it. Um, we'll go to Miss Blackman followed by James Schultz. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be here. Um, I just wanted to, to introduce myself as I am a virtual teacher uh, teaching a um, third, second and third grade combo class with the Virtual Academy. And um, I am asking for reconsideration um, from the board and from the superintendent Stevenson to um, really consider keeping the virtual program. Um, I heard some wonderful things earlier from these students and saying that students are our priority. Um, I'm not gonna go into a long arduous uh, speech, but I wanna say that we are dedicated. I've been in Berkeley over 11 years. 
um, and our students deserve as well as our families and our parents to continue a virtual uh, learning. Um, and I want us to think about that we're, we're sort of trendsetters at Berkeley and this program is just that. Um, if it were not only open to medically um, uh, students with uh, challenges, we could also even consider other students that um, have other needs to be virtual. So I just would like, um, you know, respectfully to ask that you all reconsider and thinking about um, the possibility to continue Thank the program. Thank you, Ms. Blackman. Thank Next, you. we will go to James Schultz, followed by Ms. Jenkins. Hello. Thank you for the time again. I am here to comment about Longfellow and the middle school enrollment policy that you delayed making decisions on for now almost four years. When Superintendent Stevens came on three years ago, you decided that it was not able to be decided upon how we would change the enrollment system to end the institutional racism that Berkeley has continued for the last unknown numbers of years and certainly for the last four years. Now it's three years later, at the beginning of this school year, you decided you needed to delay again because there had not been enough community involvement. Since January, there's been no community involvement that I know of. You now have number 19 on your consent calendar, which is empty and approval of a contract for SKS Consulting to continue that. I have one very simple ask that all of you demand of the administration and our lame duck superintendent. In April, next month, you decide that we will pick one of the options and that option comes up for vote after discussion at one of your April meetings in May and you change the enrollment system to stop the racism that is happening in middle school. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of coming to these meetings. I Thank cannot you. take this anymore. Thank, Thank you very you. much actually do something. It's your job. Thank you Thank so you. much for your comments this evening, Mrs. Schultz. Uh, next, we will go to Ms. Jenkins, uh, followed by Gavin Tashibana. Hello, my name is Keisha Jenkins. I'm the K-1 Virtual Academy teacher and Virtual Academy teacher leader. Berkeley Unified needs to keep the Virtual Academy program open for all in need. There are teachers who require remote teaching due to health reasons and are for their family's health concerns. There are numerous students and families who require Virtual Academy for health reasons as well. The three Virtual Academy teachers are all seasoned teachers who have taught in BUSD for numerous years and are well qualified to keep the program going strong. All of my students are performing at the same level or above as their in-person peers, so there is no learning loss. Virtual Academy has been beneficial and necessary for many family students and teachers. Next school year is no exception. The pandemic is not over and there is no guarantee of what will happen. Discontinuing the program is a disservice to a community in need. By keeping BUSD's virtual learning options open, you are continuing to meet the needs of those with specific health requirements. Please keep the program open. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next we'll have Gavin followed by Pam. Thank you, President Brown. This is Gavin Tachibana. Um, I'm here to speak as part of a parent group that started about a year ago, BUSD AAPI. We um, try to represent Asian American Pacific Islander parent interests, teacher interests, staff interests. It started a year ago around the mass shooting in Atlanta uh, out of a need for, uh, to advocate for AAPI safety. Um, we branched out into other interests within BUSD talking about curriculum and ethnic studies. I just wanted to say a few words about the uh, position you have up later on your agenda, about the Director of Equity, Achievement, and Belonging. Um, I just would like to uh, put a word in for the API community, which uh, sometimes gets overlooked. Um, in our work with Superintendent Stevens, uh, Mr. Aurelio, Director Vasudev, Director Alper, and lately we've uh, been working with President Brown, um, I think one of the things we've noticed is that there's such a wide variety within the Asian American community, and there are vulnerable populations, English ling language learner populations, and um, all of these issues that they're facing have been exacerbated by the violence we see, anti-Asian violence, and uh, the separation that we have during COVID um, in, in person networking. So please consider uh, outreach to API. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will have Pam followed by um, Aya.
Hi, hi, can you see me? Yes, welcome. Hi, my name is Pamela Shepard and I am a student, or my son is a student in the Berkeley Virtual Academy. Um, I'm trying to adjust this. Anyways, uh, luckily he's a student of Miss Tarina Blackman's that we just saw. And I'll tell you what, um, what a gift she is to the program. Um, I enrolled Rio in here because I have health issues and I'm a solo parent. You know, I, there's no backup parent here. And so I'm very concerned about catching COVID and I am a healthcare provider. Um, I have a lot of risk factors. Um, anyways, the idea of him losing Miss Blackman is, is just, it's really harsh because she has an amazing gift for reaching across the, the barriers of the computer and connecting with all her students. They, he loves her, we all love her. Um, so if it's not off, offered, um, we will have to go to another school like K-12 or the Connections Academy. And I was just reading a little bit about them, evaluating them. And they, you. They're, they've increased, but their scores are really dismal, but they, they're, that's where our students are going. Uh, Thank sad. you, Pam. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I'm so sorry to have to, to cut you all off, but in order That's to okay. hear everyone, I have to. I'm so sorry again. Uh, next, we will have um, Aya followed by uh, Diane. Can you help me? Hi, my, my name is uh, Aya. My child has been attending the second grade virtual academy with Miss Tarina Blackman. Again, I cannot say enough about how wonderful she is. We have uh, been extremely impressed as a family with the quality of care that we have received through the virtual program. Ms. Blackman is a treasure and so is the virtual program. Both parents in her household work at home and together we've been caring for a child at home. He has been happy and that's what matters to us. The virtual program has been a critical support system for us to keep our child safe from the waves of variants that are still very unpredictable. Please leave the, this critical support system for families that opt to keep their children safe at home during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will have Diane followed by Jenna. Ms. Barrios, can you please uh, promote Diane Kong? Perfect. She, she is on. Okay. Hi, Diane, welcome. In the meantime, uh, Ms. Barrios, can you promote Jenna? And we'll go ahead and jump back to Diane. Hi, Jenna, welcome. Hi, Jenna, welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jenna Hepler, and I am a second grade teacher at Ruth Acti Elementary School. One of the reasons I came to BUSD six years ago was that Berkeley generally has lower class sizes than other surrounding districts. Unfortunately, class sizes vary widely in our district, which negatively impacts our ability to serve our students best. It is important to keep our class sizes low for so many reasons. First of all, I'll have the ability to provide more individualized attention to each of the students in my full inclusion classroom when the classes are kept around 22 students. I can really get to know them and it provides them the opportunity to get to know me. We can talk and joke together and really understand each other as people. My students are more likely to participate in class, feel part of the classroom community and form relationships that may last years. I also have find that I am able to identify many different learning styles in my classroom. It is priceless to be able to know how a student learns best. I'm able to differentiate my lessons so that if they are not understanding it one way, I can try it another way that is more suited to them. It's also easier to identify and intervene in any learning or behavior difficulties that may be there. With smaller class sizes, I have the time to read and thank know you. students. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, next, we will have uh, Matthew uh, Tiedlum followed by Owen.
Hi, good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak here. Um, I sent you uh, the board earlier uh, an email. Uh, I'm asking that you remove uh, from your consent calendar today the item regarding the uh, addition of plant operation to the Milvia Street project. Um, the reality of uh, the plant operation uh, real, uh, situation uh, has basically thrown a wrench into your spending uh, either in or within or without or outside of Measure G uh, funding, um, which requires that you pay uh, much closer attention what, for what's happening here. There, uh, this project has been problematic from the get-go, um, thinking about $200,000 and more for each parking spot, something that can fund uh, 70 years of parking elsewhere. Um, and, and actually, the, both the project and the addition of the plan operation to it have not really been discussed. It passed from the subcommittee to the discussion item. And today, this $55 million decision is hidden there in the consent calendar. I'm asking you to actually put it aside for a moment and really think about what it is. You have an asset there of in the middle of downtown Berkeley, across the street from Melvia, from the Berkeley High. You have to treat it properly. You have to maximize it, the use of it for the people and for BUSD. Please, please Thank you. think about it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. At next, we will have Owen followed by Sheila Daniel. Hi, Owen, welcome. Hi, sorry about that. Um, my name is Owen Latham. I'm um, a special education teacher at Berkeley High. Um, I'm here to um, share why this job has become unsustainable for me and my family. Um, since I started three years ago, uh, I've had to work multiple side gigs in order to make ends meet. Um, I've never been able to get paid what's been advertised on the job board site. Um, fast forward three years since my initial hire, I'm not even uh, being, uh, I'm not even close to being able to sustain my job here. I have a master's degree under my belt now, but with a teacher salary that's so far from covering the cost of living in the Bay Area, Bay Area might as well be nothing. Um, my wife's been laid off twice since the start of the, the pandemic, which means I've had uh, to cover benefits for my child and my partner. My end of the month take home pay does not cover rent. Um, and other expenses. Last year, extra pay that I earned at BUSD through subjobs, caseload overages, and extra assessments wasn't paid until five months after it was due. We racked up debt at home while we were waiting, and we barely broke even uh, when we finally got reimbursed for the money owed to me. Um, I will be taking a new job at another district that pays full benefits to me and my family, and um, I can only hope that in the future, Berkeley, yeah. Bye. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. And next, we will have Sheila Daniel, uh, followed by Val uh, Cipollone. Wait. My name is Sheila Daniel, and I have a fifth grader and a seventh grader attending school virtually here in Berkeley. I am thrilled and more than satisfied with the current level of, of instruction currently in place. I'm a parent currently following the science of our professional medical community, and I continue to be concerned about the COVID pro uh, progress. It doesn't appear that COVID is done with us as yet. We should continue to be alert, concerned, and watchful, and continue to follow our competent science professionals as, uh, as how COVID may affect our school-aged children in our community. The CDC has been tracking a new variant, the BA2 variant that has been in the United States for about two months and is currently spreading now in New York State, including New York City and also in New England, increasing in hospitalization. It represents 50% of all new cases in the United States. The CDC states that it has learned it is currently more transmissible than any of the previous variants. The CDC stated that they are closely watching and tracking increasing numbers. Um, uh, the CDC expects the variant to continue to increase. 
they are continuing. Thank, thank you. I'm so sorry. Sorry to have to cut you off as well. Thank you for your Let's comments. keep the virtual learning in place for 22-23 school year. Thank you. Thank you for your comments this evening. Next, we will have Mahogany at NorCal. Oh, I'm sorry, Val. I'm so sorry, Val. Val okay. then followed by Mahogany. I'm so sorry, Val. Thank you, President Brown. Um, I am here tonight uh, just to comment uh, quickly. Um, I'd like to keep the bell schedule redesign uh, process on everyone's um, uh, in in everyone's view. Um, we have a group of uh, very concerned uh, parents, many of whom have direct and relevant professional experience to lend to this discussion, and we're having a very hard time. Um, uh, we're struggling to be more fully involved in this process. We believe that the process needs to be um, data-driven and to date, uh, we're not seeing evidence of that. Um, the process though, the um, more time has been added to the process calendar, it still seems rushed. The stated goals of the process keep changing and to date there has, no, there has been no demonstrated connection between achieving the stated goals and changing the bell schedule at Berkeley High. Um, interestingly, two out of the three equity showcases that President Brown has brought before all of us have um, dealt with middle schools adding more teacher-led instructional time to the day. And it's benefited, they have demonstrated the benefit of more teacher-led instructional minutes, not less. Our concern is that the proposed Redesign Thank schedule you. is is doing the opposite. Um, so please engage you. the parents who are wanting to be engaged. Thanks, Thanks. Val. Thank you. Uh, next, we will have Mahogany, um, followed by Laura. Hi, I'm asking for reconsideration. I have two students that are in the. Um, independent study program. I just recently was able to attend a meeting with my daughter who's 12 years old, that after reviewing her own IEP, um, and this was also through the support of a, a identity that she was able to, to develop, being in this program and called a meeting to everyone that was there um, to be able to advocate for herself. She would have never been able to have an opportunity or see herself so closely where she could say, um, uh, to such experienced people, the staff, um, uh, about things that needed to be changed and how they, how things were written and how she was viewed. Um, my other son, um, who was carriage in the BIS program, was able to advance his credits and now needed to return back um, to salvage his, um, his, not only his credits, but his future. So I'm asking that you guys really reconsider this program as it is needed to protect the pipeline that is um, uh, not looking out for the children that are coded in the 600 black children. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments this evening. Um, next, we will go to not Laura, but Lada. Hello, Lada, welcome. Thank you, um, board members and community. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Rivas, and I'm the parent of a second and sixth grader at Mendes and Longfellow. I'm also a former member of the family engagement team uh, serving BUSD families for eight years. I'm here to share my thoughts on the proposed new structure for the creation of a Department of Equity, Achievement, and Belonging. Bridging educational services with family engagement is key. Family engagement is an e effective equity strategy. When done well, it's trauma responsive and culturally responsive as a practice. It's about building relationships to impact students' academic outcomes and success, not just in school, but in life. With regard to the reorganization and creation of a director of equity, achievement, and belonging, I'm really pleased to hear that we are now bridging all of these different services, as I mentioned, together under one umbrella. And my hope is that it is tied to a strategic plan for equity across our district, not just in instruction, not just in family engagement, and outreach, but in everything, in budgets, in the way that we um, do enrollment, in the facilities, and everything we do. Regarding the uh, office supervisor position, my understanding was that this position would no longer Thank be needed you. with the creation of a director position. 
I just thank, wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry to you. cut you off. Thank I just you. wanted to say that as it's time to be intentional and as a family friendly district, not just um, and, and particularly working class families. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and for our final comment for the evening, there was a lot of shuffling uh, that happened. Um, and so things got changed in the attendees. So I gave the opportunity for everyone to speak this evening. Um, and so our final comment for the evening will be uh, Peggy Scott. Thank you. Um, okay. Sorry. There we go. I didn't have those controls before. Thank you and apologies for the dog barking in the background. Um, good evening, school board members. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, my comments will be about the, um, the Title IX report. The, um, the District Civil Rights and Compliance Office update, which I was very glad to see. I do believe it's the first one. And um, happy birthday to Title IX, which is turning 50 in a couple of months. And so I'm certainly glad that Berkeley is on the bus. That is really important. My request for this report is pretty straightforward. Um, when there was first a Title IX coordinator hired, um, and that person also was given compliance officer duties. They were then loaded down by the HR department with the staff on staff complaints. They got added to that one person. It was a lot of work. That person always had too much work. But as I read this report, which I want to say again, I was glad to see, um, because the student, the staff on staff complaints are rolled in, it's very difficult to get a picture of what this is like for Thank students. You. My request is that you separate the staff on staff and that we be able to get a picture of just what it's like for a student at Berkeley High or in the district as regards Title IX and civil rights. Um, and so separate those reports. Thank you so much for calling. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will move to committee comments. Are there any committee comments this evening? Okay. Seeing none, we will move to union comments. Are there any union comments this evening? President Brown, I do have a video to share. Thank you, may you please play it. And this is the comment on behalf I'm of Regina BFT. Chagoya, a response to intervention writing specialist at Rosa Parks Elementary and the BFT vice president. Berkeley Public Schools is where I learned how to teach my students quality writing lessons and provide ongoing support so my students have the skills and tools they need to become confident and independent writers. I thank Berkeley literacy coaches Liliana Awas, Mia Caporal, and Matilde Moreo who taught me the art of teaching writing. This morning, I completed two of a three-day Wilson reading training, thanks to funds dedicated to professional development. After this training, my colleagues and I can make a positive impact on students who benefit from effective phonics instruction. Although we look forward to paid professional opportunities and apply the new strategies, it's also important to know that classroom teachers, literacy coaches, and intervention specialists, including myself, are asking, can we afford this work any longer? Can we continue expecting teaching to be our career? Can teachers stay at this pay? Will I need to take these skills to another district? I'd like to remind the board that one thing teachers are looking forward to is being compensated fairly so we can stay and continue doing important work for our students. I'm questioning whether I could afford the teaching profession and to live here. My spouse works for Unlock, a nonprofit senior care program, and we provide elder care for two in our family. I'm working four jobs to support my family. I work as an RTI teacher, a union organizer, an after-school program lead, and I get a monthly $100 check for serving as a school district trustee. Working four jobs to keep doing what I love isn't sustainable. In eight years, I went from teaching as a career to teaching as one of the four jobs just to keep up with the cost of living. Let me be the one to remind our community 
That teacher's compensation agreement last year was a 1% raise. With inflation over 7%, this year 1% will not cut it. Berkeley teachers are still at the bottom quarter for total compensation in our county. One thing that makes our jobs more sustainable are manageable class sizes. Unfortunately, there are large discrepancies between individual classes. BUSD must do a better job balancing classes between sites and within the sites. We have elementary sites where there are under 20 students in a class and some where there are over 27. We know that smaller class sizes benefit our most struggling students. Teachers can spend the time necessary to attend to more individual student needs. Specifically, with smaller class sizes, teachers can serve their students with IEPs through accommodations and differentiation. In the spirit of BFT's posters that hang across the city, support Berkeley students and teachers, strengthen community. The school board can do this by giving teachers fair compensation for the essential work we do, fair competitive compensation. BFT's class size proposals that will be introduced next week will help all students succeed and help retain our educators. Thank you. Thank you so much for our union comments. For the record, union comments get six minutes, so that's why it was a little bit longer. Are there any other union comments this evening? Seeing none, we will now move to board member comments. And I am going to call on Director Sinai to go first. Thank you, President Brown. Um, first, I would just like to thank everybody who came out to the meeting tonight for public comment and all the parents who came to talk about virtual learning. Um, I appreciate the support they've got for their teachers and um, uh, look forward. I'm, I'm hoping, Dr. Stevens, if you can maybe mention um, kind of what the plan is for the virtual learning and independent study in your comments, because my understanding is there will still be opportunities for um, independent study for Berkeley BIS. So I'd like to have some clarification on that, too. Um, and I'm enthusiastic about the presentation on the STEM program at Willard. Uh, President um, Brown, thank you for bringing that forward. It is so exciting to see exposure at a sixth grade level that opens up um, the joy of learning and the experience of learning for all of our students. And with the, the equity vision of the STEM program of really looking at how do we increase opportunities for um, our students who are typically underrepresented in STEM um, I think all of our sixth grade exposure is really, it showed uh, today both in the enthusiasm of the students um, and the diversity of the students, including girl, a lot of girls, which is really important in STEM. Um, it was really exciting to see that. So I wanna thank the Willard folks for coming out. And I also wanna give a special shout out to uh, CTE director, manager, Wynn Skeels, who has provided just stellar leadership in working with our teachers and our communities on developing these uh, CTE pathways and raising a lot of funds to be able to carry it into the program, both during the traditional day and after school. So um, I just wanna applaud uh, all three middle schools that have launched this program and express my appreciation to the Willard folks for coming out tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Director Sinai. Uh, Student Director Mascareño Swan, are you ready? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, yeah, I would also just really like to thank everyone from Willard Middle School who came and presented on all the work being done there in order to improve, improve like um, equity of education, especially around STEM. That was really great to see. And also just all the parents and um, students who came and spoke about um, the independent learning that was also really, it's always great to hear community input on things like this. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the data dashboard can success framework and just the continuation of that discussion, um, as well as learning more about what we're doing to increase our engagement of families and um, reaching out to the community in that regard. Um, and lastly, I'd really just like to encourage everyone to take a look at the update on Title IX information from the district. 
like one of our commenters said, I believe it's the first one that we've released. Um, and I think it's just really important for the community to see what's going on in the district um, and at our schools around Title IX and the statistics and just general actions being taken around that. So yeah, I'd really encourage you all to look at the information items of the agenda and um, take a look at the update. And that will be all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we will go to uh, Director Alper. Um, sorry, can you come back to me, President Brown? No, no problem. Um, Director Vasudev. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. I especially wanted to thank our Willard community, our students. Especially, it was so great to hear from you um, and the staff that presented on the wonderful Equity Showcase. I, too, had the opportunity to visit Willard several weeks ago and enjoyed meeting with Principal Albeck and Ms. Lent to better understand how we could continue to diversify our STEM programming. I'm pleased by the after-school STEM offerings and especially the drop-in opportunity at Willard. I think that's really innovative um, to make sure that you know, children that are taking other electives like Spanish still have an opportunity to attend some of those STEM offerings after school. So thank you Willard community for trying new things and for being just thoughtful about ensuring equity. I also wanna uh, thank Mr. Skeels to echo the comments that uh, my fellow colleague, Julie Sinai made um, because he's wonderful and has done so much for all of our STEM programs. Um, I also wanna thank the district staff and parents for a busy two days of evening meetings. Uh, yesterday I attended the SBAC meetings and PNO, was unable to make it to DLAC, but I know that the staff has been working really hard on all the various presentations and all the parents that come out to those committees. You're, your opinions are really important. So it's just um, great to see a lot happening this week. It's been a, a really busy week for the district staff and tonight will be a busy night. So thank you and I appreciate you all. I'd like to also remind the community that this week marks the beginning of the city of Berkeley's commemorative period to celebrate the work and legacy of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, which we celebrate from March 21st to April 10th. Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta formed an amazing organizing team who believed that service to others was a calling, a mission, and a way of life, not merely an occupation or an occasional act of charity. They both believe that people have an obligation to contribute to their communities and to help those in need. Both were committed to the idea that service not only strengthened a community, but that service benefited those individuals who joined together to improve a community. So um, in testament to their work, I'm really excited that Rosa Parks Elementary will be hosting various service learning opportunities and, and that will be um, culminating the commemorative period in a, in a school-wide assembly. So that's really exciting. And in addition to celebrating the contributions of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in Berkeley Unified, we also celebrate and affirm the contributions of Larry Itnion and Philip Veracruz and the rich history of labor organizing in California's Filipino community. So I just wanna highlight that as well. And lastly, I wanna update the community and my fellow board members that next Wednesday, I'll be speaking at our state Senate health committee in support of S. SB 1479, so Senate Bill 1479, which will require local educational agencies to create and implement COVID-19 testing plans that are consistent with CDPH's COVID-19 school testing guidelines, and um, which is accompanied by a significant budget request to continue funding California's existing COVID-19 testing task force and expand COVID testing to preschools, on-site after-school programs, and child care centers. As many of you know, preschools were left out of the current ELC funds in California. So this would um, fix that problem. And this is especially important since at the federal level, key COVID-19 funding is lapsing due to congressional inaction with the onset of new variants. And I think some of the speakers referenced um, the new variants that are coming out of New York. Um, key COVID-19 funding is important for our schools. And we don't know what we'll need next year, but just in case we do need something and there are future surges, it's always good to lock in those funds. And so if you're available to call in and to show your support for SB 1479, I encourage you to do so. I'll be there as a school board member and we'll make sure that you know I fight for funding for schools should we need it next year for COVID testing. So thank you all for coming tonight and I look forward to our various discussions. Thank you, Director Vasudev. Uh, Vice President Babbitt. 
Yes, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Director Vasudev, for your service. And thank you to all of my board colleagues for the hard work that we put in uh, to really make a difference, not only on the local level, but statewide. Um, last week, I had excellence meeting with our state senators advocating for increased base local control funding, uh, enrollment ADA relief, reduced contributions for employer pensions, and to fully fund for home to school transportation services. We also have Neelam Patel, who is working very hard to get um, the state Senate to uh, contribute $7 million for um, Milwaukee Forest to be built all across California. Uh, so I think that is also amazing work. And we still have um, an, an effort to get $200 million to fund uh, climate literacy education across our school districts as well. So uh, we're wishing you luck, Director Vasudev, and of course, as a board, we're wishing us all luck that we could actually get the funding that we need to meet our students' demand. As this is also uh, Women's History Month, uh, against the backdrop of racial reckoning and its deep historical roots, one incident illuminates how Black girls, with the support of organizers, are creating a more just future for themselves and our entire education system. So I wanted to announce this movie that's going to be uh, presented again. It's called On These Grounds, produced by Rosa Parks parent uh, Adriana, Ariana Garfinkel. Uh, next Wednesday, March 30th at 6.30 p.m. at the Roxy Theater in San Francisco. And I chose this because uh, we are making history right now. And so I just want to appreciate these students and our families for really highlighting these issues and working on how we create a more just educational system. Which leads me to my final comment around middle school enrollment. Um, we had a parent who wrote us today. And uh, what I got from that is that inaction is action. And our middle school kids can't wait. Uh, there were four bullet points. One says, fireproof the policy review timeline. Three years ago when Dr. Stevens started his job, he and the board quite reasonably postponed the middle school assignment decision by yet another year because he wanted to learn more about this issue and also because BUSD administration was short staffed at the time. The next two years, of course, the district was overwhelmed with the COVID-19 situation. We should anticipate that this autumn, the next superintendent will have their hands full and we will have little bandwidth for the middle school's issue. This cannot be an excuse for further delay. Please board members and Dr. Stevens take all possible steps in the spring to fireproof the process and ensure that the board votes takes place in November as planned. Bullet point two, commit to action. While the public engagement process moves forward, all board members should commit now to voting in favor of one of the two preferred solutions, rezoning or feeder schools, or a combination of the two. These two solutions were supported by 70% of the families in the BUSD study, by the BFT and the administrators union, and by Longfellow staff. This is a defining issue for Berkeley as a community and as board members individually. Point three, Move the CEC program out of Longfellow. It's only six students, and I understand the decision has already been made to move it, but this transfer should be supported. The CEC kids have the right to be in school that is not already stretched to the max attending to high student needs. Point four, modify the enrollment caps. Because of the first round enrollment disparities, almost all second and third round enroll enroll enrollees will be assigned to Longfellow, which will enhance the imbalance in student needs. Please take any necessary steps, including modifying the school's enrollment caps to enable Longfellow to better address its students' needs. Under our current policy, we can modify the current enrollment caps as we do now in the elementary school to ensure a diverse racial and socioeconomic student body. But the recent enrollment numbers for next year's sixth grade demonstrate that the school has the same image problem as in previous years. The enrollment of rising sixth graders for Longfellow in the first round is even worse than last year, only 70 enro enrollees, which is far below the 160 assigned spaces. This is attributed to Longfellow's continuing reputation as a school for high needs students. 
In contrast, King and Willard were almost completely filled up by the first round enrollees. As a result, the admissions department will have very little leeway to balance students according to the needs in the second and third enrollment rounds. So to my board colleagues, I would like to say, inaction is action. And not ensuring that all of the above means that as BUSD considers to reform the middle school assignment system, with this board being, with this being dis decided in November, we must make sure that we do not have yet another year baked in educational imbalance and segregation. We can do this through our current policy and we should. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Babbitt. Uh, next we'll go to Director Alper. Uh, thank you, President Brown, and good evening, everybody. I wanted to um, start by thanking you, President Brown, for um, reinstating the, the equity showcases that um, I believe our former colleague, Judy Appel, initiated. And, um, and I think Judy is actually here with us tonight, which is really nice to see. Um, President Brown and, and Dr. Stevens, uh, creating that space on the agenda for these showcases, it, it um, really grounds us, I think, in the in the reasons why we we all do what we do, we as board members, but those of you on district staff who who work every day in the district. And um, I know I sometimes complain when our meetings go on long, but I think this is time very well spent, and um, I really appreciate it. And thank you for for doing it. Um, uh, just um, a few words about. Um, what Vice President Babbitt um, was just talking about with the middle school assignment plan, and and we've gotten a couple emails and public comment, um, which which I appreciate. You know, this is an issue that I've felt urgency about for for many years, and in fact, have been a little frustrated at times in the past that a majority of the board wasn't sort of willing to move more quickly. Um, we had a meeting in September about this, and um, and we and. It was, there was a vote, I was outvoted actually four to one in terms of um, pausing and, and doing more community outreach, um, which I understand and appreciate. And I appreciate that Dr. Stevens faithfully sort of carried out the will of the board, um, even though at the time it wasn't my preferred path, um, but I, I understood it. And I agree, you know, with, with the, the um, suggestion and the comments we've gotten that have said, we need to do this. We need to make sure that we can vote in time um, it, by November, in order for have it to have it take effect in the next year, um, my understanding of the current plan um, is that uh, Dr. Stevens hopes to bring to us the board a model that we can vote on in actually June in the, in this this uh, school year, um, and then work on the details of that and the um, some of the issues around policy and transportation and um, uh, in the fall so that we can actually formally finally vote on it in November. So I agree with those who are saying, make sure we do that, stick to that timeline so that um, you know, up or down, we have a decision in November. Um, I did say at the time, and I really believe that we should not do this by a community vote. Um, I'm wary of that. I, community engagement, absolutely. Community input, absolutely. Um, but I'm, I'm very resistant to the idea of a straw poll of the community. And I, I said that back in September, um, racial integration is never gonna be university, universally popular, never. I don't care if it's Little Rock, Arkansas or Berkeley, California, it's never gonna be universally popular. And sometimes it'll be downright unpopular. Um, I really believe it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do here. It's one of the guiding values of our district. Um, and that under any change to our middle school assignment plan, some families are gonna be unhappy. There's gonna be people who have been zoned for King who rented or bought a home thinking their kids will go to King and now they may be zoned for a different middle school. Same for Longfellow, same for Willard. Um, and those folks are gonna be unhappy, not necessarily because they oppose integration, maybe they do, but, but because their settled expectations are upset. Maybe siblings in their family might go to different schools. Maybe transportation is harder whatever the case can, may be, all we can offer such families is a clear, transparent public process that, that aims to surface and address these concerns. Um, that's what we're giving them. Um, we made a decision to postpone any change for this year. Um, 
I wasn't thrilled with that, I, but we communicated that very widely and publicly. And, and I'm glad that we're seeing that process through. I will say, I'm skeptical that we need a lot more community meetings. Um, I think we can do this through agendized board meetings. I think we can vote on a finalist model in June of this year. Um, and if we do that, I think we can spend time in the fall finalizing the details. Um, as one board member, that's, what, uh, that's how I'd like to see us proceed on this. And um, I'm looking forward to that process. And I'll just say, finally, I would be thrilled if at the end of the day when we vote on this, that the board agreed that integrating our middle schools is an urgent priority because I really believe that it is. Uh, thank you, President Brown. Thank you, uh, Director Alper. Uh, before we go over to Superintendent Stevens for his comment, I just wanted to say a, a couple of words. The first being, thank you all so much for those of you who came to speak out to us, to speak to us tonight during uh, this board meeting. We know that you sacrifice a lot of things to be here: your time, your attention to your friends and families and loved ones, um, and sometimes even your rest or your dinner. And so uh, that doesn't go uh, over our our heads, and it isn't. Um, something we take lightly. So thank you all so much. Even if you have to uh, shorten your comments to speak to us, thank you for, for coming and, and giving your um, authentic feedback on things that are working well in the district and things that could be working better. So thank you for that. Um, secondly, I wanted to uh, follow um, my board colleague, Ana Basudev's comments and say, I'm happy Cesar Chavez and Dolores Hertha week to uh, everyone here, uh, not just in BUSD, but in the city. And also thank Director Basudev for her work back in 2021 uh, in support of that resolution to make sure uh, that we commemorate and celebrate uh, here within our school district. So thank you so much, uh, Director Vasudev. Uh, finally, we have a lot of uh, great things on our agenda tonight, and I look forward to giving my comments to when we get to uh, those items. Um, however, um, I do want to uh, call out and make sure that we have the opportunity to pay attention to the information items um, that are attached to the agenda um, and the important updates around committees that are there. So please take a, the opportunity to uh, govern yourselves according to those updates. Uh, I will go over to Superintendent Stevens because I do not want to be long-winded this evening, uh, and then we'll jump, uh, continue to jump into our Board agenda. Superintendent Stevens. President Brown, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to all of the board members for their remarks, as well as to our public for joining us this evening. Um, I thought I would start by um, welcoming a number of guests um, into our board meeting space. Um, we're very lucky this evening to have a number of folks joining us for presentations um, whose insights um, uh, no doubt are gonna to enhance tonight's proceedings. Um, so I'll start first um, with uh, both Dr. Robin Fisher and Vincent Harris who come from RT Fisher Enterprises. Um, they've been helping us through a number Number of important projects um, that you'll learn about through the course of the presentation. Uh, and then welcome as well to Kamara Gwynn, who is the manager of our African American Success Project. Uh, we're also lucky this evening to have a number of our Office of Family Engagement and Equity liaisons with us. Uh, it was about a year ago, actually, that the OFI team presented on the remarkable work that they did during, uh, during the depth of the pandemic. Um, they've been continuing to do that remarkable work in service of our families and schools, and so we're happy that they're updating us about a year after their last presentation before the board. I'd love to call out um, the Berkeley Schools Fund and Berkeley School volunteers um, who have been uh, leading really remarkable work on behalf of our schools. Uh, that includes uh, something that the Schools Fund is calling the Leading for Equity Grants. Uh, those grants uh, offer opportunities to educators and administrators to apply for equity-oriented funding uh, for special projects across the range of our programs in our district. Uh, they also, also recently um, uh, shared that they now have 600 active classroom volunteers um, who are spread out across the district contributing to the efforts of our own staff. Um, recently, uh, they have prepared 2,300 Chromebooks um, in concert with our IT program uh, to be uh, distributed through the Ed Hub, a program that they continue to operate and that has been a difference maker here in Berkeley. Uh, and then finally, they will be hosting a May 21st spring fundraiser community block party. Um, I know that they'll be advertising that widely across the community and we hope uh, to see everybody there. 
Um, I'd also like to call out that uh, just uh, this week and next, um, Berkeley is engaged in a very specific, um, and I think very special kind of community outreach. Uh, we are conducting a series of ethnic studies listening sessions. Um, there are three particular focus group meetings, one that took place last Sunday um, in collaboration with Latinos Unidos, and two more coming up, one for Black and African American caregivers on March 24th, uh, and then a third meeting uh, for Arab American, Asian American, and Pacific Islander families. Uh, taking place on March 29th. Uh, you can find more about these meetings on our website, um, and we welcome all of our community to join those focus groups. There's also a survey available for all BUSD families uh, that can be accessed through our Ethnic Studies website and through our BUSD website as well. I'd love to call out the special efforts of Joanne Ito Gates and Lita Martinez, two of our remarkable staff members, for their work on these efforts and many others. Um, as well, a special call out to all of our families for making the um, sort of move to optional masking in our schools as smooth as it's been. Um, we are now uh, well underway in this sort of new era of guidance, uh, and we've had remarkably few reports from our schools about um, uh, uh, instances taking place in which folks were uncomfortable. So thanks to all of our community members for making this work, uh, both for our staff and our students. About 772 families have now responded to our budget survey that went out two weeks ago. Um, we're very grateful to community members for pitching in. Uh, we are working currently with our advisory committees to collect feedback both on priorities and program ideas. Um, very clearly as a result of this, uh, the 772 uh, responses we got back, um, we're seeing that uh, there is a call in our current budget cycle for social emotional supports, increases to those supports for our families, um, as well as pay raises for educators and staff uh, and support for struggling learners. Uh, and then finally, I'd love to offer just a quick bit of clarification about two programs that viewers may have heard referenced during our public comments. Uh, and that is our K-5 virtual Academy in our Berkeley Independent Studies program. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the board uh, rightly set aside funding to create a K-5 virtual program uh, that would mimic the distance learning schedule that we had established during the school closure period of the pandemic. Um, that virtual learning program was a supplement to our standard BIS program, Berkeley Independent Studies program. Um, and in that program, we have three teachers, um, several of them spoke this evening, uh, and there are currently 39 students uh, uh, enrolled in that program, and, and that is a correction from the number that I offered two weeks ago. Um, those 39 students were larger in number um, uh, earlier in the year, and we've seen that number decrease over time, likely in, in combination with the availability of vaccines. Uh, we have three uh, teachers in that program right now, and then a number of support providers, including special ed providers. Uh, and that program is distinct from our standard K-8 Berkeley Independent Study Program. Uh, there has been discussion about the uh, financial viability of maintaining the virtual academy program, uh, and we uh, anticipate returning to the board with recommendations about maintaining that program or not, uh, based on our over, overall fiscal outlook for the coming school year. I would imagine that those conversations will start to take place at the board level in the month of April. Um, so with that, President Brown, I appreciate the opportunity to offer those welcoming words, um, and we'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. We will now move to approve the uh, consent calendar. Is there a motion? I'd like I'm to move. Uh, <laughs> it's Women's History Month. So <laughs> Director Vasudev uh, will move the item. And I think I heard Director Sinai seconded. Uh, is there any unreadiness? Okay. Hearing none, uh, Ms. Barrios, can you please uh, call the roll? Sure. Student uh, Director Mascarenas Swan. Yes. Director Sinai. Yes. Director Alper. Yes. Uh, Director Vasudev. Yes. Vice President Babbitt. Abstain. And President Brown. Yes, thank you. Uh, at this time, we will now move to um, our first discussion item uh, for this evening. And if you were here during our last board meeting on the 9th, you'll see that uh, staff presented some options for strategic planning um, to us as a board and solicited our feedback um, and overall direction from, from that uh, presentation. And so tonight this item comes back to us again as a discussion item and staff will present 
a revised uh, proposal for strategic planning based on the feedback that we provided last week. And tonight's presentation will include uh, a discussion about prioritization of the work, entertain the I possible idea of a longer strategic planning process, address uh, draft parameters for strategic planning, um, as well as a possible timeline for this process. And so in this evening's discussion and conversation, the Board of Education will be able to answer the question, should BUSD launch a prioritization strategic planning process? And if so, uh, what are the parameters of this process? So without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, Associate Superintendent um, Aurelio, as well as Superintendent Stevens. Thank you. Great, thank you again very much, um, President Brown. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we will, uh, both Ruben and I will tag team our way through this very brief presentation. Uh, as it's loading. Um, so this is a continuation of a discussion that took place two weeks ago. Um, two weeks ago, we presented before the board um, some ideas about a possible strategic planning process. Pardon that this is still loading. I'm not sure what's going on with this. Um, uh, that process um, uh, two weeks ago was meant to elicit the feedback of the board. I'm going to start over again on this, um, uh, trying to get my screen shared. Um, and. Uh, what we got back was feedback, uh, both related to the overall duration of the strategic planning process, uh, as well as um, thinking about the scope of that process too. Uh, we went back, uh, had an opportunity to review the board's feedback in our cabinet team, and are here again two weeks later to present uh, a revised version of a strategic planning process. Uh, we are again soliciting feedback from the board. Uh, we're very eager to, to, to hear your reactions to this, um, to this sort of set of parameters. Uh, and then uh, assuming uh, that, that we're sort of getting positive signals from the board, um, we would then do work as staff members in uh, sort of short order to bring back a very specific idea about how to approach this work. Um, Associate Superintendent Aurelio, thank you very much for for sharing. So what we're hoping to be able to do is um, share modifications based on this feedback, um, describe the value of a, a phased strategic planning process um, with a very particular emphasis on creating priorities for 22-23, uh, and then soliciting feedback from individual board members, both what resonates uh, and what might be missing. Um, we did hear very clearly as a sort of central theme and feedback from board members uh, that we need priorities We're going into the 22-23 school year, um, that we should focus on our current plans and resolutions as opposed to starting from whole cloth, uh, and that those current plans should include our existing local control accountability plan, the African American Success Framework, uh, which is in draft format right now and will be presented very shortly, our Latinx resolution, the Literacy Action Plan, uh, and we have others, and all of which have been created with extensive community input and serve as very strong um, sort of uh, uh, material for a prioritization plan. We also heard feedback that we should limit the scope and duration of a plan to just the 22-23 school year, so a tighter time span uh, than the one we had proposed uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Associate Superintendent Aurelio, could I, could I pitch to you and you could sort of walk uh, through this more? Of course. Through so through objectives? I Yes, hopefully I think I'm unmuted now. Good evening, everyone. Um, so two weeks ago, we presented a much more extensive version of this. So this is a revised um, element of the strategic plan. I think as mentioned a little bit earlier, we would prioritize the LCAP, um, really creating those realistic goals and the workload. Um, we would, as mentioned by Dr. Stevens, really focus on drawing from the existing plans, which we do have many of them. They're listed here, including CSIS within our multilingual master plan, which is in development. Um, we want to make sure that everything is clearly centered on the key equity challenges. We need to be sensitive to the pandemic related needs, which we are hearing from our community about as we are entering sort of the recovery phase of this pandemic. And of course, continue to engage both the cabinet in a workshop um, and then further engaging both the cabinet and the board in some collaborative workshops prior to the end of June, uh, where the bulk of this work would take place. And so what we've done here in this slide is sort of set up a, a new version, a sort of visualization of a potential three-phase uh, three process. 
Um, in this first phase, just April through June, a very truncated period, we would really focus on collaboration between the cabinet and the school board, um, look to secure a facilitator for this truncated process, establish a quick scope, uh, and then use the LCAP and associated projects to be able to develop uh, a set of priorities. Uh, first, that work would take place in a cabinet setting uh, and so that we had began with a draft. Uh, and then we would come back into a cabinet board workshop to be able to uh, uh, collaborate together um, to articulate a final set of priorities. Um, we imagine then that this could serve as the foundation um, for two subsequent phases of strategic planning if it were the decision of the board uh, to proceed in that way. A possible second phase might take place in August and December with a new superintendent here in the district. Uh, and we've listed out some of the potential elements of that second phase. And then a third phase that could take place from December to March of 2023 uh, would follow the board election uh, and would uh, sort of constitute the final piece of this strategic planning process. So while we're making no commitments to phase two and phase three right now, we imagine that a phase one, uh, should we sort of proceed in this way, could serve as a very strong foundation for subsequent strategic planning. So we've sort of recast the question a little bit to focus on a phase one described as a prioritization process that could lead to a phase two and three described as a strategic planning process. Uh, we're looking uh, when we're inviting the board to, to weigh in on the revisions that we've made on the basis of this feedback uh, to describe for us, we hope other elements uh, to a prioritization prioritization process that could lead to a strategic planning process. Um, what, what else is important to you? Uh, and then we have a few other questions if we just sort of move on. Um, first, a quick note about costs. Um, assuming that we were to move in this direction, then the board could expect to hear back from staff about the potential costs of this project, as well as uh, the identification of a one-time revenue source. So no further action would take place before it comes back to the board for explanation and approval. And then finally, the questions that we're interested in, the same questions we were two weeks ago. Um, should we begin this work? What elements of a prioritization process resonate with you as we describe them this evening? Uh, and what might we be missing now that we've really narrowed in the scope of a three-month process as opposed to the more broad prior, uh, um, strategic planning process that we described two weeks ago? So thanks very much for um, uh, sort of helping us with this, and we look forward to the guidance of the board. Uh, thank you so much, Superintendent Stevens and Associate Superintendent Aurelio for your presentation. Uh, board members, as we traditionally do, we will go around. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? This is your uh, opportunity to also give feedback um, to the uh, request of the, the superintendent. We will begin with uh, Vice President Babbitt. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm greatly concerned that we are um, jumping our new superintendent's involvement in, in every area of this process. Um, and I feel like we have um, district leaders right now who own all of this work, who could easily set the priorities and goals until our new superintendent is in place to actually implement them. And I'm saying that just being reminded of when Dr. Stevens came in, uh, after his first 100 days, he had a full-blown plan of what he wanted to, um, to do. And I'm pretty sure our next superintendent will have that as well. And so given that we are um, already trying to manage our finances adequately, I would just hope that we would give the new superintendent a chance to be a part of every step of this process from the beginning to the end. And I really believe that um, we can work offline with our cabinet leaders as needed to help focus and prioritize. I understand that this came about because um, some people may have felt that the board was um, giving new priorities or they were trying to figure out how to prioritize. Um, I disagree because I feel like we have been very constant since the beginning with our Black Lives Matter resolution, with our Latinx resolution. And um, even the climate literacy resolution, I haven't heard us ask for anything else. We have a framework that still has not been presented to us. So how do we start prioritizing, not even knowing what the African-American success framework will bring? We also have um, Kabe working. Oh, and I want to thank uh, DLAC for sending us such a nice note 
uh, to thank us for that thoughtful conversation and um, the questions and concerns raised by the board. So to me, it's just, uh, we have a lot of urgent priorities. So I'm pretty much at the same place I was at last week and I don't, and honestly, when I thought this was going on the agenda, I thought it was coming back to us with a list of what you needed weigh in on of priorities. So to me, I feel like I saw the same presentation and therefore I'm at the same place. Thanks. Director Sinai. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stevens, um, I have, and, and uh, Associate Superintendent Aurelio, I have a, a question that's just potentially a, a wordy. Director, Director Sinai, your um, computer's doing the thing where it goes in and out. Again. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so at the beginning, the presentation talked about um, priorities for 22-23, but the work plan um, has it going through December, March 22-23, so the year is almost over. Um, so I just wanted to get a little bit more clarification on the phasing and the timeline. If the idea is that by the end of phase two, there's actually, so I guess the question is, are these priorities for 22-23 or by the end of 22-23, there will be priority? I appreciate the question um, and, and I'll try to offer some clarification. Um, so in this sort of reconceived scope, um, what we're talking about is taking about two months at the end of this year, two to three months, uh, to create a prioritized list of projects for the 22-23 school year. Um, and that could be seen as sort of a discrete body of work, just creating that priority list. Um, we're then presenting as phase two and phase three options, um, which could broaden the sort of our planning to something that might more traditionally be described as a strategic planning process. Um, that it could, could include, you know, the description of a broader set of goals, um, creating ad hoc committees, a broader set of community engagement, uh, and that might have a longer time span associated with it. And so we just tried to articulate that one might feed into the other. Uh, but we're not proposing that the board would approve a phase two or phase three now, uh, but would wa rather wait until next year uh, to see how necessary that feels. And um, as Director Babbitt just noted, um, to give the new board, uh, new superintendent an opportunity to, to join the district. Okay, so just to clarify, you're asking for, should we move forward on phase one? That's correct. That's the only okay, question thank you. That we're asking this evening. I appreciate you clarifying that. Uh, Director Alper, followed by Director Vasudev. Thanks, President Brown. Thanks, um, Associate Superintendent Aurelio and Dr. Stevens. Um, so I, I, I also haven't you know, changed my views on this. I think I, I, I hear the different, um, I know that some board members have different views and um, I think that this is a thoughtful um, approach that, that doesn't, that that does the work that I hear cabinet saying we really want to do and need to do, and um, and that a number of uh, us on the board um, also believe it needs to be done, but doesn't um, overwhelm the new superintendent um, with, with with more than than should be um, than than we should be doing. Um, so I kind of like the balance that it strikes. I think we should move forward with phase one. Um, and I appreciate the, uh, the thought that went into this. Thank you, Director Alpert, Director Vasudev. Yeah, I also just wanted to thank the superintendent and our associate superintendent um, for coming back with um, some, some more thoughtful explanations about the strategic planning process. And I do hope that we move forward. It is, you know, my thoughts haven't changed since last time. I'll say the same thing I said last time. It is a best practice recommended by the California School Board Association to have alignment between the LCAP the strategic plan and your superintendent's evaluation. So I feel strongly that we that this is a best practice from CSBA. We should move forward with this. Um, it makes a lot of sense to me that the metrics and accountability portion be saved until there's a new superintendent, right? So we can get buy-in from that superintendent. That makes a lot of sense to me. So I appreciated seeing that. I think in terms of starting, one of the things, um, I know we said the start with the LCAP, but I would also say like, let's start with our equity resolutions. 
And um, for the community part, there's, I know that we have a strong API group and we also have, um, you know, we've done some work historically with the welcoming schools curriculum for our LGBTQ families. And so I wanna make sure that those priorities are also taken into consideration early on that we're comprehensive in our equity work. So both, you know, with the LCAP, with our equity-based resolutions and, you know, ethnic studies and checking in with our API group too, that we, that um, you know, we're a little bit more comprehensive with our equity planning from the get-go. That would be my, my only constructive feedback, but it makes a lot of sense to me that we would save the metrics and accountability part for the new board and for the superintendent. And hopefully at that point also get alignment for that superintendent's evaluation too. So we can really practice CSBA best practices. So thank you so much um, for your thoughtful presentation. I still see hands from Vice President Babbitt and Director Alper. No, you just didn't put them down. Okay, thank you. Um, for my comments, I definitely wanna thank Superintendent Stevens and Associate Superintendent uh, Aurelio. Last week, we gave very specific feedback around um, the strategic planning process and how it needed to um, include a place for priorities um, and how we need to use the leverage of our LCAP and what our LCAP, our LCAP plan, right? Because that's where our, all of our district priorities land. Um, so I just wanted to give an appreciation that that feedback was taken into account um, in this revised version of uh, the strategic planning process includes that. Um, I, I specifically gave feedback around uh, needing to prioritize right now um, so that the work that we do for the rest of the year um, helps us to, of course, in, in the school year strong, but also uh, in the school year with structure. Um, so I'm appreciative uh, for, for this addition to phase one or this um, re-envisioned part of phase one. Um, I agree with the comments that all of my board colleagues said around uh, the new superintendent coming in and needing to uh, find his or her place um, in the process, um, his, her, or their, excuse me, place um, in the process. And so I, I'm appreciative that this plan um, also allows for that. Um, uh, and, and the one thing that we don't, that we haven't had the opportunity to call out that I'm also appreciative for uh, is the uh, changing of the final engagement um, and allowing it for, for it to be uh, in phase three, um, as well as uh, phase two. And so um, I know that was in every part originally, um, but I appreciate now going back to the community to engage them uh, when we have something concrete to give them, to allow them to engage on. So thank you for that. Um, Director Alper, I just saw a hand. Was that a mistake? Me? Oh, sorry. Maybe no, I was... I, I, think I think it's Director Sinai playing playing those hand games. So go ahead, Director Sinai. Yeah, you know, it's hard to see the hand in this background. <laughs> so um, I, you know, I asked for the clarification, so I just wanted to chime in on my opinion um, in the sense that I do think it makes sense to do phase one. Um, and I just maybe an additional clarification is for for um, our community to know that when the board meets with the cabinet due to Brown Act, that that's a public meeting, right? So there are, if, if I recall, I don't have this, you don't have to pull up the slide, but I think it's a two meetings with board and cabinet. Um, so there's two opportunities for us to make sure that some of our key stakeholders are also chiming in during that phase one period on prioritization, because I know I really appreciate that the LCAP is in there as kind of our overarching you know, priorities and goals. But again, there's a lot in there. So being able to kind of take the lens of our equity work with our deliverables that we've identified in our LCAP and bring those together, I think will actually really help a new superintendent for their first year to know that we've got priorities going into 22, 23. And they can get their 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 feet firmly rooted and continue whatever process then makes sense. Uh, thank you, Director Sinai. Um, board directors, um, are there other elements to a prioritization process that could lead to strategic planning that we did not get to discuss or talk about or offer? 
I think some degree of discussion on the district's processes. I know a lot has been done this year, but just continuation of its processes for trauma um, informed education for staff and for district members, as well as students surrounding sexual harm um, and Title IX staffing would be important, just so we have some degree of forward thinking in terms of funding and execution of programs um, and trainings for both staff and students moving forward, just to ensure some degree of continuation and like um, alignment in future years, since I know that funding might, um, funding comes and goes. So I think it's important to have some overall strategic alignment in terms of what we're looking for um, surrounding that particular issue. Thank you. Uh, Director Basudev. Thank you, President Brown. I um, just want to say today, uh, you know, prior to coming to this meeting, I, I was looking at a strategic planning process from another district. And what I really enjoyed is that they got their students involved pretty early on. So I don't know if that's possible. You know, when we use the word community input, I think in the second phase of the planning process, that's very broad. And we, we're often talking about like state, the parent stakeholder groups, which are really important. Um, but if we can incorporate our students as part of that, I, I would really love that because I think it's important to just hear from the ground what what do you need from us um, to feel uh, successful in our schools, right? To feel that that we're serving you best. And so um, I would just encourage us to make sure we're explicit about pointing out student participation as well. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Babbitt. Um, can you tell me what what the scope of this will be? Will this only focus on ed services? Or are you including to um, include priorities for the back of the house as well? Uh, we appreciate that question. So uh, we're imagining extending beyond ed services in a discussion about priorities for the district so that we would include things like technology um, and facilities just to identify key priorities for the coming year. And will things like our hiring timelines be included and what needs to happen with that? Things like, um, I think we had a caller talk about how they weren't paid for five months later. Would that be included? Like, It could be. Um, the point of the process to, is to identify the work streams that would become the priority projects for the 22-23 school year. So, you know, specific, as an example, specific to human resources and business services uh, might be the ongoing work to convert from QSS to escape. Uh, and no doubt there would be other priority projects. We haven't named any of those priorities yet. We'd hope to through the process we just described. So is there a reason why our associate superintendents can't come up with their goals and objectives to, to do this work through the next year? Uh, that's, I think, uh, Director Babbitt, that's exactly what we're proposing that they would do, that it would be sort of a, a cabinet, a facilitated experience for cabinet where they're able to, in a uniform way, come up with uh, priorities for the year. Um, and then I think a critical part of what we're proposing is that we would come together in a workshop setting uh, so that that draft set of priorities could be discussed um, among all of us, uh, really with the idea of sort of getting a greater level of agreement about those priorities and greater coherence for the coming school year. So what is the timeline on that step before we go spending money for consultants? Because you know, when people spend a lot of time and money, that's salary dollars, right? And so when they're in meetings, that's salary dollars. That's not them actually having the time to focus on business services or human resources or the reorg that's needed for ed services. So we haven't uh, specced out a timeline specifically yet. Um, that would be part of the next part of the work we do. Um, what I imagine, well, I can sort of channel some feedback that I'm getting from cabinet members is that a project like this um, feels to them to be well worth the time. Um, and if it leads to a sort of a greater sense of clarity about prioritization uh, and a greater coherence moving into the 22-23 school year, that, that, that it's worth the time that it would take. Well, I'm not saying it's not worth the time, but I'm saying there's prep time that needs to happen before you even get to spend the money with a consultant on collaborative cross-functional time. Um, so uh, I it don't seem know. like that's built in because to me, it would seem like between April right now with all of the priorities we have and ending the year, 
it would seem like between April and the end of this year, if they were able to have their own departmental project timelines developed, have time to collaborate with the people whom they work with, the people whom report to them, time to properly identify what are all of the issues and the problems, by the time our next superintendent gets in, then we would also be able to take all of what they have already identified, start with a consultant so we can have a more um, functional kind of tract, like a, a faster paced tract, right? There's prep work time, and then there's time to get the consultant to prioritize cross-functionally how this works. Um, and I feel like they are the leaders who already know from at least this year and years beyond what the issues are people have been raising. But yet I've never seen a plan to address just that. I don't want to hear about hiring timelines again. I don't want to hear people continue not to get paid. So where is the problem? Where, where is the process where we just start with individual leaders starting with what the problems are and what is their timeline to fix that before we start looking at a new strategic process or plan that we're not going to be able to implement because we still can't hire people timely because we still haven't been able to get our uh, contracts in place in time enough to so we end up with 1.8 million dollars underspent fund just because we didn't hire people so that's why i'm asking if we could think a little more logically, and do you agree that that's a need? Maybe nobody else agrees that it's a need to first get what is in your, what is on your plate right now? What are the problems on your plate right now that you need to identify and have a timeline to work through? That way, when the next superintendent comes in, they have a better picture of what they really need to address strategically. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the comments and I'll, I'll try to respond. Um, you know, each department manager does have a set of priorities and goals that they're working on. Um, those are both reflected in their own evaluations for the year, um, but they're also reflected in the work plans that they're leading with their own teams. Um, you've raised a, a couple of examples such as payroll or hiring timelines. Um, and our department managers are actively working on process improvement now. Um, I'm sure that either one of them in these particular instances would be happy to come and present um, either on, you know, on progress towards those goals um, or would be happy to offer updates. Um, and so those are a little bit distinct than what we're describing, which is creating an overall set of priorities, both for cabinet and the board that shared across the sort of joint governance structure of the district. Uh, and what I'm sort of hearing both in feedback from uh, some board members, but certainly all cabinet members, is the need to create a, a sort of a greater, more shared sense of priorities among members of cabinet and board uh, for the purpose of sort of creating focus, uh, enhancing the opportunity to succeed on a prioritized set of projects for the 22-23 school year. Um. Student School Board Director Moscadena Swan, followed by Director Simon. Um, I just wanted to echo what Director Vasudev um, said about student engagement. I think that that is really important. Um, I know there was a, a process to get student student engagement for the superintendent um, search and like finding prioritizations for what students wanted in that. Um, I think that would be a useful template. I believe that there was an email sent out to student leadership, um, setting up a meeting time, setting up a meeting time for students to come and present um, their goals. I wasn't able to make it. The email was sent out the day before the meeting, um, and the meeting occurred during a school day. Um, absences were excused, but it was still like time that I was missing from my classes and I was only given a day's notice, which I feel is not a good way that we should be engaging our students. I think the students need a lot more time and also just better outreach um, than just an email. So I'm hopeful that in the future and in other processes, like ideally this one, um, there's better engagement for, for students, but I do think that that's something that's really important. And I think that reaching out to our student leaders is a great way to do that. Um, given that we have easy access to all of them, there's a remind, an email, um, and meetings every other week. 
So I think that that would be a very useful place to begin engagement, even attending one of the leadership meetings when all the student leaders are in the same place. Um, so I would really recommend including that as part of the process. Should, if I can, I might jump in just to offer sort of a, a quick point of clarification is that um, in this revised scope, uh, you know, we've described the first phase as a, it's a very truncated period of time. It's just about two and a half months. Um, we'd really envision that there's sort of just two key pieces to it. One would be sort of work with cabinet to develop this draft list of priorities. Uh, and the second would be, you know, board workshops in open session uh, to be able to collaborate and refine those priorities for the 22-23 school year. So in this first phase, it's quick and dirty. There's not a lot of time put on the clock, um, and it's really working on those priorities. In phase two and three, if the board were to sort of adopt to go in that direction, um, that's where one might envision the sort of more robust community and student engagement uh, that, that we've been talking about right now. Yeah, it, what I'm recommending doesn't have to be in phase one. I just would like it to be a part of this process should we decide to proceed. Got it. Director Sinai. Oh, Vice President Bebe, I'm sorry. I thought your hand was still up from last time. Um, Director Sinai and then Vice President Bebe, can I come back around to you? Well, I just wanted to follow up on what Dr. Stevens just said. So it might be more timely. Okay, go right ahead if that's okay with you, Director Sinai. Okay. I just wanted to know, so you said, are you asking us today to just give direction on phase one or all three phases, just to clarify? Uh, just the first phase, Director Bevin. Okay. So, Director thank you. Um, so maybe um, to be as so bold as to identify maybe an elephant in the Zoom room, it's that you know part of this prioritizing might be something to get postponed or paused um, in the effort to focus. And I think that's kind of where, I think what we've been hearing from cabinet and is that you know we have a lot of priorities and we have a lot of things and there's a capacity question, whether it's on the instructional side of the house or whether it's on the administrative side of the house. And I think what I'm hearing folks uh, from, the, from staff say is, we need some prioritization. And I, I think having cabinet take a first cut um, is important, having it come back to the board because it fundamentally is the board that needs to set the overall direction and, and policy and whether or not we're working on the things that we've identified as the highest priority. We wanna be able to have that give and take. But I think I'm, I'm just assuming what it means is that, and, and Vice President Babbitt, I agree with you. It's like each department needs to identify what the priorities are. But if you've got kind of too many balls flying, I'm going to totally mix my metaphor. But, you know, if you've got too much flying, you can't do, you know, you, you can do a little bit not very good, or you can try to hone in on some priorities. So, you know, I, maybe I'm reading that wrong, but I think that's part of, phase one is let's figure out what we have the capacity to excel in and to do well. And it might mean that phase two helps figure out what that next round of things that are still very important, but have to be incorporated in a way that we can you know, deal with within a budget, within staffing, within priorities and the like. So you know, I just kind of wanted to give my read on context that I'm hearing. Um, Director Sun, I, I could not say that any better myself, um, that that's exactly what we're proposing to do. Director Alper. Yeah, just real quick. I couldn't say that any better, except that my audio wouldn't be going out as much as Director Sinai's is going out. Um, but um, yes, I, that, I'm really glad you said that, Director Sinai. That seems exactly right, as Dr. Stevens just said. Um, I, I want to. I, I just quickly want to second what you said, Director Vasudev, about the students and Director Mascarini and Swan. I think that's really important and um, and exciting to think about. Um, and you know, of course, there's a lot of different ways we could go about doing this. It sounds like um, uh, there's there's a lot of support for the way that the staff has recommended we go about at least this phase one. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to 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 doing that and to starting on it and and hope that we can get moving on it.
Are there any other comments or questions on this item from board members? Uh, Vice President Babbitt and Director Alper, your hand is still up. So are you guys saying that you need a consultant to help you identify the, the problems and the, the timeline plan to deal with that between now and June in your individual department? Because that's what you're asking me to pay for, really. You're asking me to approve a consultant to help superintendents, uh, several associate superintendents, come up with the fundamental structure of a timeline of priorities in in, within their own departments. I just can't wrap my hand around this spend of, of funds when it's going to take two months to do that with everything else you already have to do to close the year. Right, and then it's going to take. Once we get the new superintendent, you'll be ready to start with an actual consultant, and that money can be used better because that superintendent, he, she, there can be a part of the full conversation. Because, and I'm saying this from someone who spent a lot of time helping BOSD develop the LCAP strategic plan, and. I know once you get new people in, I was here watching board meetings when so many positions were being created and so many structures were being built. And now none of that stuff is operating in the ways in which it started off operating because the players have changed and the visions have changed. And so all I'm asking is that we take the time to do this prep work. And then when we spend the money, we spend the money with the actual person who's going to be responsible for overseeing the full implementation and being able to have their vision included for the district. Could that not be a possibility that the board could agree with? Is it that we have to spend money now or can we trust our the people that own this work already to do this preliminary work until the next superintendent is on board? Director Vasudev. Um, yeah, I guess, is that question for the board members or for our superintendent and associate superintendent? Vice President Babbitt. Well, we're the people who have to give the direction. So that's why I'm asking the board members at this point. Right, I guess um, for me, after attending that CSBA training, it was pretty clear um, that a lot of districts use strategic planning consultants it seems to be um, pretty standard process. I know in the nonprofit world, it's used, we use strategic planning consultants. In the private sector, you use it. Um, school boards use strategic planning consultants. So it seems to be a very common practice. And so for me, I don't, I personally don't see an issue with it. I'll just jump in really quickly. Um, uh, for me, I just wanted to having a consultant is the, the purpose of having a consultant is to professionalize the process. Um, I think, you know, we have really incredible staff members who are fully capable um, of, of doing their priorities and, and defining priorities. Um, but for me, this professionalizes the process. It brings the board in. It has to be done, you know, publicly, which will also bring in um, the community. But it gives us um, a professionalized process to go through. Um, I know in just to, to your point, Director Vasudev, in my research, my conversations with other districts, um, this is not a, a like a foreign process. Um, I know you know that, Director, uh, Vice President Babbitt, but this is one that's... Um, I think you're not hearing my question. I'm not saying that we don't need a consultant to help professionalize the process. I'm saying when the timing starts. I'm saying, do we know clearly that if we do this between now and the end of the year, that our departments would have had the time to first go through, meet with their staff and tell us tell us their issues. I mean, our associate superintendents are on this call. I, I'm not sure if there's a reason they can't weigh in on this, but I'm just trying to say between now and the end of the year with all the priorities we have to close the end of the year, if we could just do that, it's a matter of when we spend the money on a consultant is what I'm saying, not if we spend the money on a consultant. Do we spend it now before we've seen these clear, how we're gonna fix our current problems timelines and that being identified? Or do we spend the time internally with our professionals who can do that part in my belief 
and then get a consultant later. But I don't want to beat a dead horse if the horse is dead. Just let me know it's dead. I'm just saying. Oh, it's been dead. You keep giving it water, so. I'm giving it water because I don't want Water CPA. Like, I don't, it's just, this is just not how you, uh, the timing of when we bring on a consultant is my issue. Mm -hmm. I think we're bringing on one before we've heard clearly or given time clearly. I don't know. Have they already had the time to do their uh, priority processing internally with their departments. I'm gonna let uh, Director Sinai and Director Alpert um, go, but you know, just to respond to, to your question, um, Vice President Babbitt, I think when we talk about like parameters or we talk about what is needed to continue in this process, I think that is, I hear what you're saying around the consulting, but I also hear and wanna amplify what you're saying around the work, because I think that's, you know, important. So I hear you saying the piece about developing the, developing the priorities uh, within their departments first to be able to to uh, bring it into this phase one process um, and so although you know i'm not going to speak to the part around beginning with the consultant now um, i do want to ask the superintendent to respond to to that part yeah our um our sort of collective thinking is that the process would benefit a great deal by bringing somebody in to help for this sort of short run of time um, and i see that there's a couple of um, advantages particularly so in having somebody who can help us um, think about a pri priorities in a uniform way across departments meaning so that they're presented in a uniform way um, each department leader right now writes department goals in slightly different ways. So that may be a way that we facilitate some sort of cross-departmental collaboration. Um, another of sort of potential value then is bringing us together as a shared cabinet and board goal, uh, group uh, to be able to workshop this draft set of priorities um, with a facilitator. Um, and again, sort of working towards the, the mutual agreement on these priorities. And I think that I want to sort of underscore the value of having mutual agreement across the entire governance structure, both cabinet, superintendent, and board, um, as the real value add of this short two months of work. Uh, it's about sort of shared, shared understanding of priorities uh, and a shared commitment to maintain focus across the 22-23 school year. Director Sinai and then Director Alper. The, the only thing I would add um, to what Dr. Stevens was just saying, I think, you know, maybe the term consultant you know, is loaded. Because to me, what I'm hearing is a facilitator, somebody who can bring the department heads or the cabinet together, help frame the discussion. Because I think part of what we need to do with the priorities is that it's not a silo, it's not each department just set up their own priority and work plan, but it's also the synergy between the, between the departments and elevating what are those priorities and what are the trade-offs, right? So again, kind of going into that elephant in the, in the Zoom room is if some things need to go on pause, that, what impact does it have? You know, you make a decision on the HR side, what impact does it have on the ed services side? You make a decision in the special ed side, what, that, what impact does that have over here? So facilitating that discussion so that as a group, we can come with understanding that these are the priorities we're gonna start with. And, you know, hopefully it will set the stage for, you know, the new superintendent and, you know, the larger, you know, strategic plan that people want to do. But having someone facilitate that, it is a distinct level of work that um, would relieve anyone on the cabinet from having to actually, like, figure out how to facilitate it while at the same time they're trying to do their own department work. So, you know, I, I don't know what the dollar amount is. You know, I th think we're not saying yes to a blank check. That's not what I saw in the presentation. I heard a comeback with dollar amount. So if it's a facilitation of a two month project, I don't anticipate that to be a big dollar. amount. Um, so, but you know, we all have another bite at the apple when you guys come back and say, this is what it will cost. Uh, Director Alper. Yeah, I agree with everything Director Sina just said. Again, I think she said it really well, and I don't have anything to add. Um, it, it'll we'll, it'll accept that you know it'll come back for the actual budget item, um, and 
you know, it sounds like this is, anyway, I agree with what Director Sina said. Thank you, I, I agree as well. And I really just wanna highlight uh, the point that Superintendent Stevens made around um, staff's asks and needs uh, for this and prioritizing um, this work and our uh, response and our diligence, doing our diligence to ensure that we uh, support staff and support the work uh, throughout the district. I mentioned before in talking about going through strategic planning process, uh, especially in, from the context of an incoming superintendent. I never give my students a, a test without a pretest, right? And so I think it is in our best interest to provide um, our incoming superintendent uh, with a good foundation and um, a good place to, to work from. So uh, I don't see any other hands for this comment, Director Alper. I'm assuming that your hand is still up from the last round. So I don't see any other hands. Um, Superintendent Stevens and Associate Superintendent, do you have the direction that you need from the board to move forward? Right. Yes, I believe we do. We appreciate the discussion. Thank you. I too appreciate the discussion. It was very rich. Um, and I appreciate everything that you all shared, board directors. Uh, we'll now move to our second discussion item of the evening. Um, and I'm like um, many of my board colleagues, really excited about this uh, presentation. And so uh, the African American Success Framework has been a buzzword, or I should probably say buzzwords, uh, throughout the district for many, many months. And our, our district, our community members throughout the city, uh, our partners throughout the city have engaged in and have gotten excited about the framework and uh, began to find have begun to begun to find their space in this work. And so. Tonight, we are really honored to have uh, the presence of R.T. Fisher Educational Enterprises, who will present on recent community engagement activities related to, to the development of the draft of the African American Success Framework, as well as um, the progress on the development of the data dashboard. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Fisher um, and staff at R.T. Fisher Educational Enterprises, as well as um, our very own Mr. Kamar Oakwin. So please uh, welcome, and we are excited for your presentation this evening. Uh, and thank you, President Brown. You kind of took took my, my speed. I was going to introduce them, but you just introduced them for me. So I'm actually going to turn it over. No, you did a great job. Um, <laughs> to Vincent's going to be you're sharing your screen, I believe, Vincent. Um, and I and thank you all three of you for being here this evening. And I'm just going to mute, mute myself and let them take it over. Absolutely. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. As Mr. Harris is bringing up the presentation, uh, you know, it's uh, getting late in the hour, so we won't be long, but we will be thorough. Um, and we would like to save and make sure that we have time uh, at the end of the presentation for um, discussion, comments, concerns, et cetera. Um, but tonight, um, next slide, please, Vincent. Uh, we're going to come with um, three outcomes and, and priorities for this evening. Uh, the first, again, we want to uh, make sure that uh, we are giving an update around just the current African American Success Framework. Uh, we also want to highlight and talk about uh, our spring priorities. And then lastly, we want to uh, provide an update around our emerging lessons, um, as well as uh, some of the challenges that we've uh, faced and come across thus far in the process. Uh, but first, we have to get grounded. Uh, we always want to make sure that um, as we're doing this work and, and moving forward, we want to catch people up to speed who haven't had an opportunity to be in the know uh, as much as others, as well as continue to make sure that we're grounded. And so uh, without further ado, I would like to pass it to Dr. Robin Fisher to provide a contextual overview uh, for our work. Thank you, Kamar, and thank you, directors and Superintendent Stevens for having us be here again. I'm here with my colleague, Vincent Harris. And when we talk about setting the context, we have, this is our third time, uh, as we talk about the African-American Success Framework uh, presenting in front of you. This evening is an update so that you can see the progress that we're making and what that looks like and means. But as Kamar said, before we start, there has to be some setting of a context. To, we look at data uh, very regularly with respect to the work that we're doing and it informs our work. And we just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page with why this initiative exists, why this framework is being written and created is because our students uh, in Berkeley Unified 
require some additional supports. Uh, and this slide shows us why that's the case where our students are specifically as relates to discipline and our academic achievement, where our students are with respect to uh, overrepresentation in special education, uh, the trajectory of our students from elementary to high school, and what that looks like in each of those very important transition years. And so the, the idea of this work that we're doing is steeped in, we see this data and we are all committed as we know that you are as well committed to seeing this changed in a very systemic way. Uh, please, next slide, please, Vincent. And the way that we do this, we must remain targeted and focused, as you all have been discussing this evening, about how do we prioritize what's the most important things that we should be focused on. And this parent who uh, has been engaged with us says it better than anybody else can. She says that I really appreciate this effort of really reaching out into the community is what she was saying and listening to us. And she says that I think we as parents are putting our trauma and our sorrow, sorrow excuse me, and, our da and damage on display in these sessions. And we do it because we love our children. So she asks all of us, uh, good stewards of the resources that have been provided to all of us. Now the question is, what will you do to honor our sacrifice? And so we take that very seriously. We take these young people's lives very seriously as again, we know that you do. But again, that's our focus. We must remain targeted and focused. And we must remain targeted and focused. And we're gonna just move this right along, Vincent, if you wouldn't mind, uh, to really be thoughtful about who we are and what we're doing. So BUSD already supports students in a variety of ways. And I'm gonna have you pause for just there for a second. There is an African-American success initiative. Superintendent Stevens uh, has stated that in December when we launched what we were doing this academic year in full fledged and what this initiative really is about. We know it has to do with curricula. We know that it has to do with professional development. We know that it has to do with programs and services and partners. But what we're focused on tonight is really this idea of a written plan of action, the framework. If you could hit that for me, please. This is what we're focused on. Uh, there are a number of elements that make up this initiative, but we really want to focus on the framework. What is, as you all have been just discussing, the strategic plan that really is going to be about how we implement this framework and what it looks like. Now, this framework, just as a reminder, has five interrelated areas. The first is that we've looked, studied extensively past district efforts. We have absolutely looked at those research on effective strategies that work best for African-American Black students and what that means. We've engaged in some significant community feedback. We're currently working with educators to get their feedback on the plan. And then lastly, and most importantly to us, is that we are steeped in this idea of a theory of transformation for improving outcomes, not a theory of change, but for transformation. That the work that we've been studying with respect to best or past district efforts, we cannot regress, we cannot revert. We must transform uh, what's happening for our children uh, in the district. And that's what the framework is really thinking through how to do that over a three year period. So this is a strategic planning process and it is looking at what needs to happen over a three year period. We also know that this work has to, if we talk about this theory of transformation, we believe, and this is the work that we've started again 18 months ago, that if we do three things that we can begin to see improved student outcomes, specifically as it relates to Black African American students, we are engaged in a very rigorous stakeholder engagement and needs assessment in the district currently. And we're doing that district wide as well as at school sites. We believe that if we do that, then the next thing that we have to do is create recommendations with very strategic actions for school sites that engage in our work and identify those partners or those resources that will support what these recommendations are. And then third, we believe that once we have that information, we need to be able to monitor whether or not what we've put forth is working. Right? What does that look like? What works for whom, when? 
and identify those metrics. And we're gonna talk about the data dashboard and how that's gonna help us. And we believe that if we do these three things, then ultimately what we're doing is building a long-term set of practices and strategies that will sustain and scale best practices to achieve desired results for our students, again, at the center of this work. So this is that theory of transformation that we believe that if we do these three things well, that we will begin to show improvement of outcomes uh, for our students that are really targeted for this particular initiative, again, over a three-year period. Now, as you may recall, there are four recommendations that have actions. The first is that we want to improve academic performance for our Black African American students. We want to engage in show strategic actions or make recommendations around high quality differentiated professional learning. We wanna make sure that our school sites are safe and inclusive and that our culture and climate welcomes our families into these spaces. And then lastly, we wanna be thoughtful about how to make recommendations that engage our families and communities in authentic ways, where again, they feel as if they are participating in this process. Uh, with that frame, uh, what's really important, uh, we can go to the next slide, is that we've started really digging deep into this work. And so, Kamar, if you want to give some idea or give folks a, an update of the work that we have accomplished thus far and where we see uh, going for the rest of this academic year. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And as we begin to think about how this work all kind of uh, congeals and comes together, uh, we begin to ask ourselves, you know, how do we move from um, planning into action? And, and based on that, we needed to make sure that there were some operational activities that we, one, put in place and on a standing basis and, and regular basis that gives us the opportunity for a regular tempo and cadence of discussion and alignment around our work to make sure that we're consistently on the right track. Um, and so you see that represented in the uh, first kind of larger um, 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 horizontal bar, right? And so there's a, a standing planning and coordination meetings that happen um, in several different um, groups. We have our district partners who meet on a monthly basis. We meet normally on a, on a monthly basis with um, Board of Governors. Uh, there's a senior leadership meeting that we have, a steering committee, which then takes the direction from our senior leadership and thinks about how do we then move it forward throughout the organization, Edu educational services leadership team, department, et cetera. And so those meetings are continuously happening from September and will continue throughout June. But you can see dating back to fall of last year, just a number of uh, spaces and places in which this conversation is happening and in which we are gathering data and making informed decisions. One of the things that I, I wanna highlight is that as you are having these conversations in places, you begin to sometimes stumble around things that need to get adjusted. And you will see starting, I believe, maybe December, early January, this need to kind of develop um, a, a platform and a tool to be able to get information out to the community on a regular basis. And you will see strategically the development of an African-American Success Framework website that is now available um, and fully actionable for the community to access through our BUSD webpage. And so in these spaces and tempos of conversation, sometimes things come up that don't have to wait uh, until we ride out a plan. We can figure out a way to get actionable around those things in the moment and to, to meet a need as we, we see fit there uh, in that particular time. Next slide, please. And so we know that uh, this work is, is collective impact work that is gonna take um, all of us to roll up our sleeves. And so what you see represented here is just a, a number of the partners that are involved in this work. Um, and, and as I said earlier, we meet monthly on a, on a regular basis to begin to think about how do we work together? How do we streamline our efforts? Make sure that we are um, putting our efforts towards the right objectives um, so that we can together reach the outcomes that we see fit. Vincent, next slide, please. The reason why I wanted to highlight and we are highlighting partners is because this is kind of representative of how we can bring this collective work together. And so you see here represented here um, the area STEM steps program, which this year has uh, reached down to third grade and now extended from third to eighth grade. Uh, and that happens on a, on a monthly basis. But then you also see to the right of that our college bound program, which is focused on, on, on ninth through 12th grade at the high school. So what does that mean? Why do, why do we bring these two up in particular? Well, what it represents for us is um, our intent to be um, intentional and thinking about continuous pathways of opportunities for students to engage and get supports throughout their trajectory, uh, TK through 12 here in the district. And so if you could imagine a student perhaps um, is taking STEM steps uh, in the third grade and continues through that uh, program, them and their family through eighth grade, but then we kind of, in 
metaphorical sense, pass the baton on to college bound so that that student can then get some support as they're transitioning into high school. And so this gives us a way to think about uh, not only are we representing and bringing partners together, we're really intentional in thinking about where are the gaps and how do we come together to make sure that there's a continuous opportunity for students all the way from TK through 12. Next slide, please. All right. And so as we uh, begin to think about who do we need to talk to, you see that there's a diverse group of, of stakeholders. We're talking to students, we're talking to families and community-based organizations, uh, as well as staff. And so you can see, I won't number them out, they're not numbered, but um, you can go back and look at some of the actions that we've been taking um, post kind of Omicron surge, the surge, um, as it's known as. We've been really ramping it up from um, mid to late January, and we'll be continuing this month, going into next month as well, with our engagements. Uh, most publicly um, have been our um, community-based engagements, uh, but also there's a lot of things here that the public oftentimes doesn't get a chance to see that is happening behind the scenes is a way that we are also collecting and gathering data. Next slide, please. Um, and so we begin to then think about, um, as we have been early in some of our conversations, several themes have, have kind of surfaced and come up. And I, I won't go through these um, exhaustively. You'll have the, the slide deck and it'll be there to go back and reference. And you can make your own conclusions about um, how these things begin to kind of piece together. Uh, but just some of the things I, I wanted just to kind of highlight is that what stood out to me uh, amongst students was there was this real sense and the early themes. And we'll know that we'll, we'll go back and we'll continue to comb through uh, the data um, comprehensively as we go towards the, the end report. But at least early on in our conversations, we're noticing that from students, there's this sense of wanting to have a sense of belonging, um, belonging in the classroom, belonging outside of the classroom, um, making sure that um, teachers and staff and faculty are really wrapping uh, their arms around our students. That has a bit, been a big need that has come up. Amongst our families and community-based organizations and partners, uh, there's this notion that there are inherent assets, inherent assets within the home and the community, but also inherent assets here within the district, right? There are district partners who are at the table now who are saying, we are ready for this work. We're ready to be engaged. Just let us know how. Uh, that has been a bright spot and a highlight from our partner meetings. And then lastly, our staff, making sure that um, out of our themes that we're really looking at what our staff are saying. And one of the things that can cons consistently coming up is this idea of resources and sustainability. Our staff are, are keenly aware that um, for those have, who have been here for a very, very long time of the tendency sometimes for organizations to uh, set the sails and start in one direction and then quickly pivot. And so um, our staff are really lifting up the need to uh, provide resources and sustainability. Uh, one individual in particular, this goes towards the last kind of uh, bullet point where it says make sure that the district um, has sustained efforts to implement the recommendations. This uh, staff member shared with us that um, they would like to see um, a normalization of motivation meaning that we must begin to shift our culture in the district to make sure that this is not a motivation um, in the moment action, but this is something that we normalize over time. And this is why we're calling this thus the framework, because it's a framework for how we can continue to move forward as an organization. Next slide, Vincent, please. All right, and so thinking about uh, spring 2022, uh, which we're, we're here now, what are our initiatives and what are we gonna accomplish over the next several months? Uh, we're going to complete our engagements, uh, both with staff and then out, outward facing with the community. Um, from there, of course, we'll have more information to go back and perhaps revise some of the recommendations per staff and community um, input. Uh, we are then, um, and Dr. Fisher will talk towards this in greater, in greater depth uh, later in the presentation, but I'm happy to uh, think about uh, launching our uh, early adopter uh, work. Um, the Willard will be one of those school sites thinking about um, early adopters who have said, Listen, we understand that um, this is happening at a high level at the district. We really want to bring this to our school sites and see this um, in action. And so uh, we'll share that in greater detail a little bit later. Uh, we know that um, there's a huge need to make sure that our summer programming is robust. And we'll talk about that in a second. We want to finalize our dashboard um, and then as well begin to, to frame. And this is a new item here um, that we're bringing this evening is to frame what um, the the kind of constitution or what the guidelines would be for an African-American advisory board, meaning that as we talked about earlier, what do we need to operationalize? Well, there should be, and we are hoping to begin to put um, the framework in place to say, where is the group of community stakeholders and parents that we turn to when we have questions about, are we on the right pace for our decision-making and what we wanna do for African-American students and families? Next slide, please. All right, and so uh, this will, 
be unfamiliar to, to many, but I want to highlight a couple new things here. Um, this is just kind of the timeline overview. And again, this is fluid. This often kind of uh, shifts as priority shift that can happen from week to week. Um, but this is at our best given time right now, answering the question, um, are we on track? And I would say resoundingly, we are. We are on track to accomplish everything that we set out to do. Um, and two of the things that, again, I want to highlight is just this idea around we have added columns around this early adopter schools. Um, and so that is new work here, uh, as well as thinking about framing out kind of the early parameters around a um, African American advisory board. I'll pause just for a quick second to let you orient yourself around um, this kind of slide deck here, but um, it'll be there for you to go back and reference um, later down the road, but it just gives you a sense of our overall timeline. Uh, and just to reassure that we are indeed on track uh, to meet our objectives. Okay, next slide, Vincent, thank you. All right. And so um, as this year, I can't believe it, but as this year is, is looking towards uh, summer and we are turning our attention that way and continuing to do the work that we um, are doing now, uh, we're also thinking about what are opportunities for summer for African-American students and families. And so you can see that um, again, our partners um, are been listed at the top in terms of coming together and thinking strategically about uh, what can we offer over the summer. I can say that uh, what we have prioritized is that we would like to have students for as long as possible in the summer, right? We would like to prioritize uh, our time with them, and we would also like to focus on uh, measurable academic outcomes, right? Uh, there will be opportunities for enrichment. There will be opportunities for fun, but we know that there's been a lot of quote unquote learning loss in the last two and a half years for our students. And we really wanna make sure that we're putting forth uh, opportunities to be able to um, help our students be as successful as they can as they go into the summer and return for next year. Um, there was a reference for um, STEM um, in the Willard presentation. And you can see here uh, in the April category, as we begin to think about what type of programming we can offer, there has already been some thought about um, STEM-based related activities that we may can be able to bring forth. Next slide, Vincent, please. And I'll pass it back to Dr. Fisher to talk in depth um, and provide a little bit more context around our early adopter school network. Thanks, Kamar. And as you all can see, we've been incredibly busy you know, really wanting to make sure that we meet the uh, timelines that you all have asked us to meet, which is by the end of this academic year, we really have a three-year strategic plan in place that has been very thoughtful uh, about reaching into the Berkeley Unified School District community and what that looks like. And one of the things when we did that was that, and because of the surge as well, is that how can we um, identify ways to provide uh, opportunities for direct service, really identify ways to provide interventions, really take a look at the theory of transformation that we're proposing in a smaller context or um, proof of concept, what that looks like it means. And so uh, we have a group of schools uh, that said that they had the capacity this spring to begin that work. And they are called the Early Adopter School Network. And these schools will begin to engage uh, with the framework in a very intimate way and the way in which it is intended in through a process, a strategic planning process, if you will, of really being thoughtful about completing their own needs assessment of what's happening for black students on campus, developing an action plan that is in alignment with their SIPSA. So it's not above and beyond what they are being asked to do. It is taking a look at their strategic plan and really being very thoughtful about how to include uh, strategic actions that would meet the needs of the black students on their campus based on what we see from the data dashboard. And then implementing those plans, creating a monitoring process, and then ultimately the intention of these ado early adopter schools is to identify the bright spots uh, and determine viability of taking what we're proposing in the framework to scale to all schools or to schools or to determine which schools they go to when over again this three year process. So these folks and these schools are the first schools to do that. And the five schools that have agreed to be what we call the coalition of the willing, the early adopters is BAM, uh, Craigmont, um, Mendez, Willard and uh, BTA. And we are excited to be able to work very closely uh, with both the cost teams and the administrative teams and the overall communities of each of these schools to really 
um, move through uh, each of these steps that we've outlined here. It's gonna be a very rigorous process. We see this as an intervention beginning in the spring, uh, continuing in the summer, and then being very thoughtful about that first semester in the fall. And that that is a true uh, opportunity to um, pilot uh, these particular strategies that we're proposing and will identify through this process. And as Kamar mentioned, this is a new effort. Again, we, we and that's what a great, I think a great um, organic process, strategic planning process does is that it shows you uh, opportunities. And this is an opportunity uh, where we actually can begin to uh, implement some of the ideals from the framework itself. So from the early adopter school network, we are now looking at if we could, Vincent, please move to this idea of why we're doing all that we're doing and how the dashboard will allow us to really um, target, really begin to drill down into who we serve and how we serve them and why, most importantly, we serve them. And our motto really is this idea of what works for whom when and being able in the strategic planning process of the framework to be able to have a variety of strands available so that we can see again that pipeline of from TK to 12 what that looks like and means for every a Black African American student to be touched by some aspect. And we've talked about that on a macro, meso, and micro level with respect to this framework. And so I'm going to pass it to my uh, colleague and team member, Vincent, just to give us an update on the dashboard so that you can see how all of these pieces uh, fit very intricately together. Vincent? Thank you, Dr. Fisher. And, and, and really, as we look at this slide, it's meant to emphasize, too, that you know the dashboard is but a mo part of a mosaic of multiple measures that we're using. Uh, you've already heard a debrief on some of the measures that are actually listed here. This notion of interviews that we've done, focus groups, you know, the notion of personas is really understanding the point of views of, of everyone in kind of the ecosystem, students, families, teachers, uh, administrative staff, community organizations. And then actually the early adopter group really represents our case studies. That's where we're going to really say, so where, how do these things actually land in service to students. And so this is meant to give not just a, a mosaic of just data analysis, but actually all the data, which some of that data is actually the living, breathing data of those who are part of the system and a part of the community. So as we talk more specifically about the dashboard that's in prototype, so we're kind of in the pre-beta stage, so we are still kind of bringing it together. So, so I won't say this, the ta-da, that, that'll more happen in June on, on the timeline. But really what's important tonight is just giving you a sense of how we're starting to unpack what we're seeing. And so we have a data set that Brea was able to provide for us. We have basically a Q1 data set. We're, we're waiting to, to get the Q2 uh, semester one uh, data set, hopefully within the uh, next several days. Um, but what we're using with the data is actually an opportunity to kind of, how do we make students visible? As Dr. Fisher said, the real uh, default here is really this ability for us to open ourselves up to conversations, looking at some high impact indicators, if you will, or key performance, in, in, key performance metrics and saying, what does this tell us and where do we wanna dig deeper? So we ask questions about what are we seeing and from there, we ask, what are we getting curious about? And what do we want to know more about? And then most importantly, what ideas does that generate for us to suggest action planning that becomes maybe potentially longer term solutions that emerge long run as bright spots for us? And so again, we'll be looking a little bit at some of the data that we got for the first quarter. So here you have a snapshot from the prototype of the dashboard, again, uh, still in kind of the beta version, if you will. But as you look to the left, basically, as Dr. Fisher spoke to, this is the notion of how do we see students uh, and see communities of schools. And so there you see various points. And again, you know, many uh, organizations, you know, obviously your district as well has frameworks in which you're sharing data. So we're not suggesting the data itself is, is going to necessarily be totally unique, but the way in which we're looking at it is to open up conversations because we know data has multiple purposes in all organizations. Some data is used for research. Some data is used appropriately for evaluation. In our context, the data is being used for improvement. And so a lot of what we're doing here is trying to unpack at a school level as you look to the left and then work your way uh, to the right, looking at student group data, students with disabilities, uh, the gender of students, grade levels, home language, all of this is to help us dig deeper, get curious. As we look at the middle of this sheet, we have kind of two strands of our dashboard. One strand is TK to fifth grade. Uh, this gives us a sense of some of the high impact indicators. Again, these may change over the next several weeks as we think more about what are the highest impact things we want to look at. But for now, at least, 
we basically have uh, relegated into kind of two big categories. One is attendance, because we know it's really important for our students to be present. And as we think about coming through the, the pandemic and, and the resolution of kind of the new normal we're in right now, uh, we think attendance is probably something for us to spend a lot of time thinking about. And we've heard that actually uh, from one of our principal focus groups as well. And so what you see in the middle here is that, for example, for the students who we have in our data set from Brea, we had about just under about 3,900 students for TK to fifth grade. And about 70% of those students, 71% of those students had an attendance rate of 95% and above. Of course, there's research around 95% being kind of the floor, if you will, for very good attendance. And so what that opened for us then is this conversation to say, so how do we look at the variation? And so the last two columns to the right uh, provide context on the 431 African-American students that are part of the 3,900 students. And so this opportunity is for us to say for African-American students, what's, what's, what's the threshold that uh, students are meeting uh, for the 95%? And in this context, we go from 71% kind of overall to 51% for African-American students. You know, obviously can't make a, any suppositions or assumptions. It now opens an opportunity for us to be curious. Why is that? What can we do to, to understand it? And then if once we understand it, what can we do to perhaps lift that number up in terms of percentage of students who have a attendance rate above 95%? And then you see the other high impact indicators we have here are very much tied to performance on the assessments that the district offers. Just again, using the cut point for students who are scoring at or above, whether it be DIBL, the reading benchmark or that benchmark. And again, looking at that variation, so again, with the reading benchmark, looking at 36% of students scoring uh, above uh, the benchmark, uh, overall 21% for African-American students, again, opening up conversations about, so why is that? And then getting curious about what can we do about it? So as Dr. Fisher spoke to, particularly with the early adopter schools, it's gonna be, how can we take action uh, to support African-American students to close uh, the distance there? And actually, to some degree, do we identify practices that support every student on that campus? This is our other dashboard that we have in process, and this is more of our secondary dashboard. So this takes us through grades six through 12. Um, and so again, the theme is very much similar, right? It's this notion of being able to look by school site, by student group, um, by student identifiers, and an opportunity to say, okay, we can look at a general population of students, but then disaggregate as appropriate uh, in order to understand the variation by student group. In this context as well, you know, we've identified attendance still being the number one indicator we're looking at. So still having that 95% threshold uh, as a way to say, okay, let's let's dig into a conversation about who's coming to school and have an opportunity to say, what can we do to support those students who perhaps have an attendance rate that's not quite where we want to be? Um, I'll actually point you on this slide to the bottom portion where we're looking at this notion of students who are getting Ds and Fs. That's really what the bottom row gets at, um, this notion of the percentage of students with, with, uh, below a C. And so you can see if the general population in secondary, it's about 25%. For African-American students, it's 46%. Again, an opportunity for us to ask kind of the questions of why. Um, let's get curious about why this currently exists. And then equally important and, and certainly longer and more important, what are those things we might try and experiment with to reduce that distance going forward? So again, the dashboard, as Dr. Fisher spoke to it, is a way to make students visible so that we can take action. First, see them, understand their stories, both in terms of the quantitative quanti quanti data, but equally important, those things I shared on the prior slide, the qualitative data as well, because we are having student focus groups. And so we have an opportunity to kind of triangulate conversations. And, and, and out of those student focus groups, we've heard students themselves say, we want more academic and social emotional support. So that's where we see the intersectionality of the data points that we're using that, that will give us the credibility along with the research on those things that we're proposing as best practices. You know, with that, I'll turn it back over now to Dr. Fisher and, and she'll uh, start our, our wrap up. So Kamara, would you like for me to go over the lessons learned or would you like to, sir? You got it, thank you. So one of the things that we really have been very thoughtful about is documenting this process for you, right? So that as a district, you'll have this, you know, you know, uh, institutionalized, you'll have this document that says what happened, you know, where did we run into issues? What does that process look like? So that if you ever chose to do it again and or look back to see what that looked like and meant, here are the things that we have identified or are keeping track of. You know, one of the things that we want to do is that we want to ensure that the recommendations align. And this is important from the last conversation. I was listening because I think it's important as a member of your district for all intents and purposes to be in alignment with your strategic actions, your priorities. I heard that word come up a lot. And this plan, this framework is about aligning with your strategic priorities right? And being sure that it is not 
something that is tangential to that, but that it is part of, which is, as you re may recall from our first meeting together, that we cross-referenced all of your accountability reports to ensure that we weren't doing something above and beyond, but that it was in alignment with. We want to make sure that we're very thoughtful about defining roles and responsibilities uh, in order to make sure that task ownership is clearly defined so that as we talk about this idea of consulting and what that looks like or a facilitator, that it's the role of that individual, us in this instance, to facilitate a process, but ultimately it's the district's responsibility to implement that. So we're being thoughtful about what does that take and what does that mean and defining very early on uh, the responsibilities for implementation. We're really trying to make sure that we build effective collaboration check-ins to pro proactively, and this is important, resolve bottlenecks or barriers. Uh, this process is one that is very complex with lots of players involved, and we want to be very thoughtful about how to ensure that there is transparency in the process, as well as that there are ongoing check-ins like this evening for you to be able to see what the process is and ask questions accordingly. We know that there are going to be a budget priorities that the district has and that this the implementation of the framework is going to have budget implications. So we're being very thoughtful again about that as we uh, outline the framework to be uh, very um, considerate of what the cost of the resources to actually implement the framework might be. And then lastly, we want to make sure and we heard it here this evening from your student representative and others, that we wanna identify any missing BUSD community and make sure that their voices are not just heard, but are included and that we document it and that we cite it so that you can see who we spoke to, what they said, what that looks like and means uh, in the appendix of this particular framework. Uh, and that will be along with the research that we used. Again, Superintendent Stevens has been very um, diligent about making sure that this is about evidence and citing our evidence and making sure that there is a way for us to ensure that again, for long-term, uh, hopefully uh, sustainability, that it has to be based in evidence uh, and research. And so these are the lessons that we are uh, working through. And then lastly, uh, Kamar, since I'm here, I'll just say that our next steps are, uh, we are completing the spring 2022 strategic actions that uh, Kamar mentioned. Uh, we will uh, be working diligently. We see the summer program as an active intervention, and we are working very diligently to make that come to fruition with the initial um, target population of the students that participate in the early adopter schools, uh, and then the vision schools, and then open to those students who meet the criteria with respect to that intervention, third through eighth grade, and what that looks like and means. We will be submitting a final written report framework uh, at one of your June board meetings. You will let us know when that is and what that looks like. If there's another update prior to that, we wanna make sure that you see a draft and can respond accordingly. Uh, and in that plan will be um, a 2022 uh, through 26 work plan so that you can really see this three-year framework with next year um, highlighted so that again, uh, when you think about when we think about implementation, uh, we're very clear about what that looks like it means. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we are with the African-American Success Framework. And we stand, all three of us, ready to um, answer any questions that you might have uh, and or suggestions or ideas as we continue to move uh, through this uh, pretty rigorous process that you all have asked uh, and invested in. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Uh, before we open up the question um, and answer, we can go ahead and unshare so that you uh, can see the entire board. But before we open up with the questions and answer period, I just wanna give an appreciation um, to you all. That was an incredible presentation. Um, we felt the fire, the excitement and the work, right? Because you all are doing work. So thank you um, for that incredible, incredible presentation. Um, I'm going to open it up to my board colleagues for questions. Um, I'm going to do something I never do, which is to provide framing for this uh, question conversation um, with an ask. And my ask is that uh, we keep the intention of this conversation focused on uh, the groups of students who it is intended to serve. 
Um, and so that is my framing that I'm providing to you all um, as board colleagues. And with that, I will uh, take the first set of questions from whoever has them. Uh, Director Alper. Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll start. Um, I really appreciate this, all the work that went into this and that presentation. Very impressive and um, a quick sort of particular thank you for the summer school um, work. It's it's so important. It's such a, as you as you mentioned, Dr. Fisher, such an important um, uh, intervention opportunity, enrichment opportunity. It's just um, it's something that we've never quite gotten right. I think even though we've done a lot of really good things um, in our summer school and we've improved it over the years, and I think I think it's really ripe for um, for even more work and improvement. So I really appreciated that focus. I had a, my question was one that I was thinking actually about something that um, that Vice President Babbitt says a lot that, that really resonate, has resonated with me about, um, you know, we, we, we kind of know what it's, we know what the problems are. Like we, we hear, we, we hear them year after year and, and, you know, people have been in the district for a long time, you know, can kind of recount meetings where where the same you know the same things have been brought up year after year and so the, and 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 what i think she has said um you know many times very compellingly is like when you know when are we going to actually do something about it when are we going to see movement and and growth and um and i and i and that sort of leads me to a question that i had during the presentation um which is um uh, and I, and so I and I like the framework. So it seems like one answer to that is that we we will we're going through this process to develop a framework um, that we will actually commit to implementing um, and seeing it through and 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 reviewing and holding ourselves accountable for um, the implementation of it. So so that's that's what I really like and appreciate about this work. Um, I'm curious with respect to the outreach that you've done and the data gathering that you've done. Um, if you can talk about things that surprised you in doing that work are there can you can you talk about one or two things that that either students said or or, or families said or, or staff said or, or that the data showed um that's that's different than what we then you know what in fairness we could say we already knew i'm just curious if there are things that are, that are in that category well being new to the district and and, and being able to hear how uh, the community engages with the district. There were a couple of surprises, I think. The first from students, the first students that we spoke with were from um, the BTA, Berkeley Technical Academy. And those young people give us an experience or give us a perspective that um, I've looked and looked for some written documentation from that group of students and couldn't find it. So we wanted to start with those students who have really struggled within the context, within the framework of our traditional public school system and what that looks like and means. And to be able to hear a senior uh, young lady say, if I knew now or then what I know now, if I had an appropriate uh, opportunity to engage with an intervention counselor earlier in my um, time uh, in school, if I had transitioned from my middle school to my high school uh, in a way where I was connected to the high school uh, in a different way earlier in my um, high school career, uh, I think that things may have been different for me. And I'm still glad that I'm here in this smaller community who supports me in the way that I need to be supported. So it was one of those both ands that I, I wish that I could be in a space that um, welcomed me at the larger comprehensive kind of environment. And I'm glad that there's an opportunity for me to still be a part of the district. So I hadn't heard that yet in any of the documentation, but to see that you do still have students who and families that are still wanting to be very connected to the Berkeley experience um, and that there's an opportunity for them to do that in a, uh, a very small um thoughtful community was important for us to think about uh, students who uh, we may not see or hear from all the time. So that was important as we now are going to be working and seeing uh, our younger students. We've had an opportunity through STEM Steps to be able to that. We had an amazing uh, session with college-bound students 
um, and the work that they are doing under the direction of Dr. Willis. Uh, and they gave us a rich um, look into, now this is what was surprising just to answer that question. What was surprising is that students who have access to resources are still struggling with um, ensuring that their transcripts are appropriately um, are correct, you know, right? That, that they actually, that families know whether or not their students are A through G eligible, uh, whether or not transcripts are accurate and that they're able to use them accordingly. And that was young people that told us that, that they, as juniors, um, didn't find out that something was, has gone awry uh, that late again in their career. So those are some of the the, you know, um, and that has nothing to do, and in that instance, has nothing to do with academic performance per se, but it does have something to do with A through G completion and eligibility for a four-year public university. So they may be coded in this idea of academic performance, but maybe that's not it. So those are some of those two surprising elements. The students from uh, B Tech Academy that gave us some very powerful insights into their experiences overall. And these are children that have been in the system for, since TK or K, right? These are children that have been K through high school and for whatever reason, weren't able to still uh, be engaged at that high school level. So th that gives you two examples, Director Alper, of some yeah. surprises that really opened our eyes to maybe we need to look deeper into some solutions or ideas that may have not been tried just yet. Yeah, I, I just to quickly respond and follow up, not with another question, President Brown, but just with the response, which is I, I really appreciate that, Dr. Fisher. And it, the fact that you're that the two of the examples or both those examples came from students, I think is significant. It kind of points to what Director Rastadev said in the last conversation and Director Mascarenia Swan always brings up, which is, you know, the importance of talking to our students. And it, it my intuition is that we will that there's probably not a whole lot we're gonna learn from the data that we don't already know. There's probably not a whole, a whole lot we're going to learn from our staff that we haven't already heard. Maybe there's things from family family members that we we don't talk to enough that we would learn from. But but, but the but the students are really the, the the ones, especially the older students, are the ones who we can't um, who we don't talk to enough, and that we can really get real insights from that actually drive us maybe in different directions or or. or have us focus on things that we aren't uh, we aren't yet already focused on. So um, that thank you anyway for that response. I appreciate it. Might I add that um, you know I think that there is um, there isn't a sense uh, when we're when we're talking to folks in the community that there um, there's a fatigue around the conversation, right? I think very much uh, surprising enough is that folks are not tired of engaging in conversations. Uh, what they're concerned about is the action steps that happen after the conversation is there, uh, leading to, you know, earlier the, the slide that says parents are coming and sharing their authentic truth and their traumas, and they're saying, okay, now that you know that, then, then what are the next action items? And so I think that that has been a learning point that folks are not tired of talking. Folks want to engage in the conversation. They just want to know and be informed about what the next steps are. Uh, additionally, I think that folks are struggling to figure out how they have the continued tempo and cadence of conversation with the district, which is why you have this opportunity to then build out a framework around an advisory council. Uh, you see because there's a lack of centralized conversation with families for African-American students within the district, you see subsets of groups popping up at various school sites. Uh, we can go down the list and name several of them, but there you have the community saying, we actually want to talk about this, but there hasn't yet been an opportunity from the district to coalesce and bring us together to have that conversation together. And so I don't think that the community and folks um, are uh, conversation for tea. I think that what is happening is that there will be new information. Uh, we are coming off a pandemic that we've never had before, right? And so just on that alone, we're gonna have new information about what needs to happen for students. Um, and so I just wanted to say that there is a, a bit of a difference. It isn't conversational fatigue or folks are not trusting that there's gonna be new data uh, to be gleaned from the process. What they are asking and what they continue to ask is that now once you have that data, as we've mentioned, and that uh, Dr. Fisher and team gives us a set of actionable goals, do we have the collective willpower um, as an organization to respond to that and pivot in the way that we need to. Thanks, Mr. Oguin. That's really helpful. I appreciate that. Director Vasudev. Yeah, hi. I was, I first just want to thank all the speakers for coming and Mr. Harris for your presentation on the dashboard in particular. That's really exciting. And I look forward to seeing the final one. Um, I, want to, I was wondering if we could put the dashboard up again, just um, so I saw it. And I just want to make sure that I 
looked at it well. Um, so I don't know if, if anyone's sharing screen, but if we could go back to the dashboard, I'd love to see like, does that dashboard reflect all of the, um, maybe I'll wait for you to load it. I think it's the first, give me the first one. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I really love um, the dashboard and the different um, the different um, things that we're looking at here. I was just wondering, does this reflect all of the district's vulnerable populations or like with the dashboard, I, th I think you're working with the Brea office, right? To put this Correct. together. Correct, we did ask for a, a unity student set. So basically uh, to your question board member, the, the goal would be to have all student groups represented. So um, however you're thinking about it, whether it be uh, students with disabilities, students who are identified as foster, homeless, English learners, the goal would be to have a unity data set so that we could do some cross-sectional cross-sectionality uh, in terms of looking at students. Because obviously for African-American students in, in Berkeley uh, Unified, we know that special education would be a very important kind of intersectionality yeah. uh, element to look at. So that's exactly one of our goals is to look at a holistic data set of all students. And, and again, to be able to focus on African-American students, but also to where it makes sense to do some comparative uh, analysis of other student groups to try and gain lessons learned as well. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Harris, for saying that. Cause I know that like, for example, in the Latinx resolution, we also have a dashboard section. So I was thinking like, how can we take this as a template or like a best practice to use for other groups? And also to drill down on like Afro Latino performance, you know, and making sure that we're able to do that kind of cross-sectional analysis that you're explaining. So by June that will be finalized and I feel like the district would be able to use it to do that kind of cross-sectional analysis between different disadvantaged groups. Yep, that would be one of the goals. And actually, right now it's functional. So we are going to be experimenting with the early adopter schools and some of those conversations as, as we get the data set, right? Our, our biggest constraint will be, of course, whatever uh, Brea can provide to us. But that's exactly what we're trying to do is that kind of uh, intersectional uh, analysis as a way to, to, to gain lessons learned. That's wonderful. And then will Bria staff be able to, to do this on their own? Like after the project is done and you have the final dashboard in June, then the Bria office will be able to manipulate the data by themselves. Like, is that kind of like a legacy project of this framework? Potentially. I mean, again, we haven't gotten that far, Director, as to what was going to happen next. That's part of the framework is to actually say what we propose happens with all of the strategic actions. This is one aspect of it. Uh, but Bray, it does have access. I mean, again, what this does, I mean, the, the resources that the district already has can do some of this work. It is really to distill specifically as relates to the framework. Um, so the answer is Yes, and we haven't gotten to what this, all of the strategic actions are or how this would be used or what does it mean to be legacy in the first place. This yeah. could be definitely one of those products if that's what you all choose, uh, but that would have to be a decision after you all uh, review the framework and decide whether or not you approve it or not, because you may choose to do other things based on what is recommended in the actual framework. Got it. And then that discussion would happen in June. Dr. Fisher, is that? That is correct. Well, great. No, I definitely really love the work that you've done on the dashboard, and I think it's incredibly useful, and I'm excited that we can drill down on SPED and all the different um, different categories. So thank you for your hard work on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Sinai, please. Uh, good evening. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Um, thank you for the presentation, and um, there's a, a lot of really valuable information there. I really want to all the work that you've been doing. Um, I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, Mr. Gwen, I'm really glad to hear you say that there's not um, information or information gathering fatigue, because I, I wouldn't say that three or four years ago. Um, and so I think we are in a new time. So I appreciate that. And I'm gonna ask my question on that, but let me give you a couple of comments first. Um, and one is um, when you think when you think about um, the belonging part of the the framework, um, have you guys thought about whether or not we should also look at student engagement in other activities like sports, music, dance, um, extracurriculars? Because I think that's another aspect that provides a belonging and a connectedness and um, a richness 
to a young person's engagement. And it's less on the you know, academic success, but it really has a direct connection to how connected uh, students feel. And I think we've often thought you know, at Berkeley High that some of the amazing extracurriculars that we have are also somewhat segregated. So it, it, it might be an interesting thing to look at because that might be an action plan that we need to provide more extracurricular opportunities for kids, particularly African-American kids to engage with each other after school, external. So I was kind of curious on whether that was something that had been thought about or might be looked at or if it, if it connects or relates. It does, absolutely. We're looking at the holistic educational experience, right? Um, so most stand, you know, in, in, in a public setting, uh, we know education looks at standardized kinds of ways to determine whether or not a child is meeting a standard or what that looks like, what that looks like and means. And we all know that educating a child in a public setting is a holistic experience, which includes, which was, you know, originally um, the intention uh, is to socialize and to provide opportunities for children uh, to have access to all that you're mentioning. And so absolutely, we, for instance, just to give you an example, um, we, you have an uh, awesome award-winning, you know, uh, music program and uh, jazz, and there's folks that students who are performing in Oakland at Yoshi's, for instance. And if you look at who makes up that award-winning jazz ensemble, there aren't many students of color. Uh, that are participating, which would be an awesome opportunity uh, for students to participate. Now, if you look at your sports program, you see something very different. So we're looking at, at who participates and who's, um, uh, you know, uh, honored and what that looks like. So yes, we're looking at all of the indicators of what does it mean to receive, you know, a Berkeley experience and what does that mean for Black African American children and students, scholars, uh, above and beyond what a, a standardized test might say, but holistically what that looks like. So absolutely, we're taking uh, all of that into consideration when we make the recommendations. Well, and I think it's the recommendations, but also a dashboard. So I was thinking if there was a way that we could actually measure, because I don't know how much Berkeley High or BTEC or the middle schools in particular, you know, how much, or any of the programs, how much they, um, they know what kids are involved in different things. Uh, oh, that's Excellent. one of the ideas. Maybe maybe not for this iteration, you all, because rep, there's, yeah. a, there's a finite amount of time and resources right. for, for the dashboard. We're happy right. to continue and, to work on it if you like. And, but and I, initially, that's the intention is to be able to have as many indicators that we choose, but it's going to take some take some time and planning. Yes, Vincent? And, and, if I, and I'm I, not asking for it right now. But I'm just thinking that belonging is a key element that we're hearing and we're feeling. There's got to be a way yes. that we look at it. And it's not just, you know, maybe it's through the focus groups, maybe it, but also in the sense of how do we take the focus group information and then take action on it? Absolutely. So, I think, yeah. yeah, the strategic actions will definitely do that. And okay. we will cite, we'll even cite where we are making that particular recommendation from what did we hear that, uh, that, that that strategic action is being or recommendation and strategic action is being proposed, we'll actually cite the focus group, we'll cite the research, we'll cite why that is and why that's being made so that you all then can make decisions about how you want to move forward once the framework is completed. Great. Um, and then I, if you want, I can just ask my other two questions and then you Together. Okay. So one is, um, uh, Mr. O'Gwen, I think similar to what you were saying around the, um, the fatigue, but what are we going to do about it? And we're in a different time with COVID. A number of us said when we were in the heat of COVID and continue to be in COVID, what lessons did we learn in COVID that we, we don't want to just go back to status quo? But are there things that actually were going on during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, that are things that we want to think about as we look at transformation? And, you know, some of the things we heard from some of our families of color is that 
their kids were actually feeling better that they didn't experience as much microaggression when they were on, um, you know, virtual school or Zoom school? Or were there other things that you're hearing from the community that, um, you know, I, I like the word when we use disrupt, that we don't go back into just our patterns and hope things change. But, you know, so did you hear anything from what we were doing? Like we gave laptops to everybody. Is that something we need to continue to do? Digital divide. So just, you know, if there are things that we might want to continue to pursue and not retract because the pandemic, you know, when the pandemic ends. And then the second question is around thoughts around scaling the, the bright spots or the success. Um, I would venture to say from my experience of working on this stuff for 20 years, Berkeley schools are not really good at sharing their successes. There's things that happens in pockets and we don't take it to scale. And sometimes there's a hesitancy to take it to scale because if you highlight one, school or one classroom that's doing well, you know, does that mean you're disparaging the others? No, it is a question of how do you find those bright spots? So I'm curious on what your strategy is for taking things to scale. And if you've done that in other places, like how you approach it. Thank you so much. Well, I'll take the, the second question first, thinking about scalability. Um, I, I believe that that was at the crux of the conversation earlier today in terms of, um, or this evening, in terms of how do you take a set of recommendations and, and make sure that they permeate the, the entire organization. Uh, I'm not quite sure that, um, that that will be an external role, right? And I think that that's an internal question for us to be able to think about, for example, uh, when we evaluate the sense of belonging uh, in my zero year here when I first uh, came, uh, it was a sense of um, case management was the focus. And as I began to talk to students and families, they were saying, well, we really want a space where we can come and be together, which birthed the Emoja program, right? And so you think about those opportunities where sometimes there's a disconnect in terms of, um, you know, there's this push for diversity, but there's also this need and push for making sure that families and students have a place to come and be their authentic selves. And so you have the Emoja program. We're now um, year three of that program. It could be, and for all intents and purposes, and this is, I'm just using this as a case point because I know it so well, it could be a time that you say, how do you then scale that? But then we have to go back, right, as a team and say from Ed Services, right, this, this whole strategic plan that we were talking about, what now does that look like? When you move that in and put resources there, how are we pushing that forward? And so I think the scalability question for us is one, yes, we should be highlighting, right, our achievements, I agree with you there, but that's really an internal question for us about where our priorities lie. And once we place our priorities and we're clear about where we wanna go, we can then from a place of inquiry, which Vincent has so much kind of put out there in terms of looking at data and making sure we know where we wanna go, we can then come together to think about how do we scale, when's the right time and then how do we get there? Uh, but we have to decide that internally first, where do we wanna go uh, before we begin to think about how do we scale? And I don't think yet uh, we have a clear sense and hopefully at the end of this, right? Once we have our plan in place, we'll have a clear sense of kind of where we're going. Uh, the first question, I mean, was around. Um, Mr. Gwynn, can I say one of the things I think we have to do though is set an expectation. Because when you talk about your um, early adopters, there's gotta be the expectation that what we learn from these early adopters are things that we wanna, we wanna learn and take that learning across. It's not that each, because we've done this before where a school pilot something and then it stays there. Um, so part of it is how do we set the stage for the collective learning from these early adopters? Well, we've met with two of the school sites so far, Director Sinai, Sinai and um, they are right, they're wanting to be those early adopters. They, we have shared that the intention is to share the experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so that when we do try and think about scale that they are part of that process and have said, yes, that's why they're the willing, the coalition of the willing, they want to be able to do that. So that's the great news is that we have five school sites that have said we have the capacity to be just that and share the experience, bright spots and otherwise, because we can learn from those as well. And so uh, I, from the very onset, that's what the expectation has been and that we have, and again, I've been already 
coordinating on two campuses to really talk about what that looks like and mean with cost teams and administrative teams. And they're all in with respect to exactly what you're mentioning, being able to share their experiences in a, um, a thoughtful and systemic way. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna hammer on this just one more time because I think um, Associate Superintendent Aurelio and, and Dr. Steven, I think the willing are totally there. I, and I think that it's those who need to learn from the willing and their experiences that the expectation is that the early adopters are doing this not just for their own school and community, but it's for the district to learn. And that's, it, it's that translation to those who aren't so willing yet that we want them to learn to become so that they are willing, that they learn that there's things that work. So, because I, I think the willing are always willing to step up. It's, it's the other ones we want to like make sure follow, follow, follow suit. And I, I agree with you 100%. And I just want to say, that I don't want to. I don't want to disparage those that have that aren't willing. They have. They have circumstances at their school site right now that are incredibly overwhelming, as we all know. Uh, some of them are already vision schools that have a CSASE and plan are addressing that. So I wouldn't want to say that they're not willing. I just think that they have so much on their plate already um, that these were folks that were able to be, you know, able to take one more thing on. So I don't want to characterize schools um, that they haven't been able or that they didn't want to do it. I would say that they may not have had the capacity because they do have so much more on their plate potentially, and they have a potentially a different student population that they have to be engaged with. And so, uh, so I just don't want to characterize it as that either. These were folks that say that they have the, the, the capacity right now. So let's maybe we say it that way rather than not willing, because uh, I would say all of our school sites, if they have the opportunity, would participate if they could. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. And also, you know, early adopters, but even amongst that cohort of set of schools, it's not happening in a vacuum. The intent is to, to actually utilize a professional learning POC uh, framework. And so together, those schools will come together on a frequent basis. And we're thinking that um, having that institutionalized, then you can bring in other schools into the fold as we continuously build, that, build out that professional learning community so that we can all learn together uh, with some of the bright side spots. So I, I definitely appreciate the... Um, Appreciate you uplifting that and we'll make sure that uh, we keep that in mind as we're progressing. Um, Vice President Babbitt. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for all of your um, incredible hard work as a team and as managing our district partners in this process and for, I mean, February with all those different community engagements at one point felt a little bit like March Madness and you guys are real still in, still in March Madness with all of the community engagement sessions so I just definitely want to appreciate you. I put my um, area background on just to say thank you also for the African American Regional Educators Alliance um, conference that Director Vasa Dev, I and Dr. Brown and so many of our staff participated in because it was truly inspirational as is this presentation and this endeavor that we are embarking upon. Uh, due to the late hour, I just have a few quick comments that I'd like to make um, and also to just kind of fill in some of the points from our um, my other board colleagues. My first comment though is around the timing and making sure that we have staffing recommendations that we need to implement the framework before, um, before June as much as possible because I just we will need to know what uh, what pockets of money we need to reserve because to go back to um, Director Alper's comments and so many other board colleagues comments if we don't set aside the fundings to actually implement the framework and to, to do this well. Um, we will have exhausted the community one time one more time asking them for things that we actually can't deliver upon. Um, with the data, I just want to highlight to my board colleagues that the data dashboard will allow them, when they say be physical, it will also allow them to see specifically what interventions, what enrichments that a student is participating in. And that's something that I've noticed from just being on the parent advisory committee was usually missing. Even when we looked at RTI, you know, there was never a way to say, well, why do we have this discrepancy in our data? 
and what services have we offered these specific students to um, to combat that, right? So they couldn't tell us, was it this intervention or that intervention? Because they actually didn't even have a way of knowing which interventions all of these students who were in the um, that below tier threshold were in. And so that's another key element of this dashboard uh, that I think is going to help us be different than just looking at data, looking at test results, looking at classes or DFs, but actually knowing systemically what particular services, what particular programs have we offered these particular students. So that's the making them physical piece. And then um, to do that though, however, they do need Brea to actually give them the data. And so I heard you, uh, Vincent, I see that we're still looking at first quarter data. And so Dr. Stevens, I really hope that you would give Brea the direction or the priority, because I'm sure that they are willing, but the priority to make sure that they can have this uploaded. They, they can get the board the results they're asking for without them having to last minute crunch or come back to us and say we couldn't because we didn't get the data from BUSD. We don't want to hear either of those things. And I think that's it for me. So thank you all again for your hard work. And I appreciate um, the many opportunities that we have to make sure that this progresses. Again, I do have one question. I don't want to I have one question I have to ask. Do you have any initial thoughts on how this framework would be implemented um, people-wise, right? Like, how are we going to implement this within our, um, if it's too early, that's fine. But if you have any thoughts, because we are looking, we're talking about belonging, we're talking about different positions. So I just want to know how this may um, marry in that. Well, I would say from from our perspective that it is a bit premature to to think about staffing per se, but the great news and this goes back to Director Alker's initial question about the surprise your your staff has some great ideas and they have shared uh, ways in which uh, existing, you know, positions or vacancies. Uh, that exist, how they might be used in a particular way. They've been thoughtful about uh, transitions and what that might look like from eighth to ninth grade and using both existing um, team members, staff members, and what that might look like, how to um, you know, be creative in the way in which staffing is uh, thought, you know, used and thought through as far as different kinds of um, staffing plans. So the good news is, is that folks have been very generous with their suggestions and ideas that we're taking under serious consideration. And as soon as those have been fleshed out appropriately and that we've had an opportunity to share with uh, Superintendent Stevens and Associate Superintendent Aurelio, we'll make sure that, you know, that's, you know, that all of that makes sense. But I think there's some awesome proposals that have been, um, put forth by um, your your staff members and we will reflect that uh, in the framework if, if i could just add a, a quick comment uh to something both uh directors babbitt and director sana you both spoke to uh kind of these other kind of richer kind of data points about students whether it be to your point, Director uh, Babbitt, about interventions or Director Sinai about extracurriculars. You know, one constraint, and this is, you know, I, I just want to service it now so, so, so that when we get to junior, not necessarily totally disappointed, is what data is available today. So there's wide variation in the availability of club data, right? There's wide variation in the intervention data. So there's some processes that are above and beyond what a dashboard can do. Because of course, if, if, you can, if you don't have it, you can't report it. So I just wanted to surface that there's probably some process things we may recommend so that we could actually do this with fidelity. Because what we'd hate to do is like pull it and because some somebody puts it in infinite campus but others don't, right? It won't necessarily be as helpful or as impactful. It certainly won't help our research, if you will. Um, so I just wanted to just surface that as there, there may be a recommendation to, to suggest some, some processes to support the collection of some of these other data points that are important, but aren't quote unquote statutory. So, so there's variation to their availability. Board uh, directors, are there any other uh, comments or questions? 
I'm, I'm going to ask uh, just to, I know our hour is late and you all have to get on and we have another presentation, but um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned earlier, Dr. Fisher, um, around like taking a holistic approach. Um, and so I wanted to ask about um, the social emotional um, portion to this work, um, the plan for it, um, and also, um, that, so that's my first question. And my second question, um, I appreciate Direct Vice President Babbitt for bringing it up because that was my question around um, people, right? So I know that it, as you already spoke to this, but other districts are um, starting to do this work of seeing what's happening in Oak Grove, of seeing what's been popping up in other districts. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, will there be an opportunity uh, for you to provide us with um, maybe um, a structure around uh, best practices, what other districts are, are seeing, what they're doing around hiring, because it's one thing to have like this, this really incredible framework, but without um, the manpower, without the buy-in, without the implementation, um, you know, I'm, I just want to make sure it doesn't fall by the, the wayside as things sometimes tend to do, so. Yeah, and go ahead, Dr. Fisher. I was going to say, well, we've been held to quite, uh, you know, uh, an expectation that uh, this framework has all of those elements included in it. And once we have an opportunity to understand, you know, the district's priorities uh, for this first year of the three-year plan, uh, then we will move as quickly as as possible to um, bring some of those those that have budget implications to your attention so that you could make informed decisions about how you'd like to move forward. So uh, just know that that is, you know, already we're starting to think about how to do that. And again, everyone that we've talked to are, are holding this process to a very high standard. Uh, everyone has said very clearly uh, that they don't want this to be like that first bubble there, past district efforts, uh, that they want to ensure that there is movement. And I would say uh, that that is our intention as well. Yeah, and you know, this is not news, it's not a secret, but anytime uh, I'm curious about a recommendation or thinking about staffing, I begin to look at uh, surrounding districts and just peruse their, their web pages and it'll show the infrastructure that they've, they've put in place to be able to um, move forward their strategic efforts on behalf of uh, African-American students. We can look in Oakland, we can look in San Francisco, we can look at West Contra Costa and look at the um, staffing FTE that they funded to specifically look at moving forward outcomes for African-American students. Thank you both. Uh, Vice President Babbitt. Yes, I just wanted to um, thank you also for mentioning looking at other districts who are really building this out. And then just to keep in mind that our state uh, superintendent has a whole African-American success task force and there's lots of funding um, that is being dedicated specifically statewide toward this issue. And so we really should continue to um, also prime ourselves to be eligible for those funds as we come through the recommendations. And then lastly, as we think about learning from other districts, just to remind everyone that um, College Bound and Dr. Willis, they are in multiple districts across uh, California, probably even outside of California. And so it would be helpful to see if there are ways in which we can learn from, from them, any strategies, anything that they've seen in other districts that we could um, leverage here, even in this process now. That's a absolutely one of the greatest resources that you have uh, is that it is a national program. So I think that you'd be able to glean and we will act and, you know, as part of a very active partner uh, in this process, Dr. Willis will um, share her expertise for sure. And we will seek it more importantly. Mr. Gwynn, did you want to add to that? No, I, I thought we were concluding. I was going to say we appreciate the opportunity if there wasn't anything else. Well, we appreciate all of you. Um, Manager Gwynn, on you know, behalf of all of us here in the district, thank you for the ways that you've supported and led this effort for the leadership that you've uh, provided. You make us all proud in many, many ways. Um, so thank you so much for what you all have, what you have been doing. And um, R2 Fisher Educational Enterprises, thank you so much for partnering with us, for coming right into the district, finding your place with us and becoming, um, you know, family with us. And so we appreciate the approach. We appreciate um, 
the uh, community engagement, the extensive community engagement, but most importantly, we appreciate the work. So thank you for everything that you all continue to do for us. Have a good evening. You too. Much appreciated. Thank you. For our next discussion item, um, as many of you all know or are aware, um, the Office of Family Engagement and Equity is a very critical, important component of the district. Um, and they serve oftentimes the bridge uh, between caregiver engagement and support um, in our schools. And so tonight the OFI department um, has a presentation that they will give to us. They have uh, 10 specialists who work throughout the uh, Berkeley Unified School District. Um, and they work with the caregivers as well as um, their children to support a variety of needs. And so tonight's presentation will be focused on um, the work that they are doing. And I'm excited about the board uh, dialogue um, and, and the presentation so we can learn how OFI is helping to support, support some of our most vulnerable students and continue to be that bridge for, for families and caregivers. And so without further ado, I'm gonna welcome Associate Superintendent um, Aurelio for this presentation. Thank you, President Brown. And I know it's late in the hour and I'm gonna to try to do a, my job of moving us quickly through this presentation, but I, I am joined with a number of the OFI specialists um, that will be helping me do this presentation. Um, so I will be adapting a bit of it. Um, I know originally we had planned for a couple pauses for questions. I'm gonna work through the slide deck just based on the, the, the lateness in the hour and we'll take questions at the end. Um, just a quick reminder that we are always centered on our district's mission, um, and I wanted to add to that that within our own mission statement, we do have a very uh, clear component about how we engage our families and community and how they're an integral part of the success of our students and schools. Also, I want to remind um, the community that we that the Office of Family Engagement Equity has its own sort of mission as well um, in that it is rooted, rooted in the belief that family engagement is, and is any way that an adult caregiver contributes to or supports a child's learning. And it's a really important piece of the work that this team does. Another reminder is that this is also aligned, this work is aligned with our LCAP Goal 3, which really focuses on the school climate making the school safe, welcoming, and inclusive. Um, you, you've heard a number of times tonight the word belonging. Um, and later in this presentation, we'll be speaking a bit about um, a bit of the reorg and the thought we have around uh, becoming a, a department that includes equity, achievement, and belonging. So this is the goal of this presentation this evening, really give some background around the work of OFI, um, give some of, your, of our OFI staff an opportunity to really share some successes and challenges that they've experienced this year um, and some of the learning we've done. And then of course, speak about in some next steps, some restructuring of the department and the lessons we've learned. So here's a quick reminder of sort of what is OFI? And OFI really, I kind of picked out some really key phrases that captures the types of job and work um, that our specialists are doing. It's really centered on community engagement. The word relationship really stands out. Equity, partnership, advocacy, building this trust with our families, empowering them, being, you know, representing them at the school and at different levels. And there's a quote here that really resonates with the team. So I'm actually going to introduce now one of our newest OFI members, um, Ernesto Marin. And Ernesto was hired a mid-year uh, for this OFI position. He's not new to Berkeley, uh, but he is now at Thousand Oaks and the district office. Ernesto, are you on? I am. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, cool. Well, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, uh, Ruben, for the introduction. Um, members of the board, appreciate you uh, as well. Um, like Ruben said, I am one of the most recent uh, uh, members of Family Engagement and Equity. Um, I want to thank you to. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share who we are and uh, what we do. Uh, the Office of Family Engagement and Equity consists of uh, a team of ten, um, as it was mentioned earlier. Um, here you see each member on this slide and the schools that each one of them serves. Um, as you can see, Alejandra, Ramona, and myself are currently the only team members that are split between uh, one school and the district office. Um, you can, next slide. All right, it's free, sorry. 
Um, and uh, here uh, we see some of the values and uh, work that we do with the families uh, at Berkeley Unified School District. Um, I'll give you a few seconds to kind of read over these. Um, out of these examples, I just want to go ahead and highlight uh, three of them. Um, uh, cultivating trusting relationships with families, the understanding of cultural relevance, and partnering with community organizations to support students and families. Um, in my short time, uh, was it January 14th? I believe January 14th, 17th. Um, over at Dawson Notes, these three examples have been like the key uh, of what I believe uh, to be part, uh, created and helped me create the partnership between the district and the community that we serve. Um, the next few slides will showcase what, what we've learned, um, some of the successes that successes that uh, some of my uh, colleagues have done at their schools. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to share who we are. And uh, next slide. All right. Thank you, Ernesto. Um, thank I'm you. gonna just, I'm gonna do a quick summary of some of these. The next two slides really highlight, I asked the team specifically when we met, and, and just so you're aware, um, I am serving essentially as the de facto director uh, with the OFI team. Um, so it's been really a pleasure to get to know them a lot closely and, and see the, the type of work that they're doing. But I specifically asked about, what, so what have you learned um, this year and really going into last year? And so these are just some of those, I thoughts that came forward. Um, this, I will share that this slide deck was a collaborative effort by the team to really sort of capture ideas, thoughts, framing, everything that you're, you're, you're seeing here. And then just a couple more um, examples of items that have been learned, that the team has learned uh, throughout really serving our families in a pandemic. You know, the, the pandemic has had a significant impact on the lives of many of our families and our staff and it and it shows in the work that our team here has to do um, and the sort of the gaps they're helping fill so this next slide we are now entering some some sections i think jocelyn are you here i know you were here earlier i am here you are here and you're awake <laughs> jocelyn foreman <laughs> Um, greetings, board and other community members. I am the uh, family engagement specialist at I'm Jocelyn Foreman. Please excuse my voice. I'm tired. I'm the family engagement specialist over um, Malcolm X and Craigmont schools. Um, my thing that I wanted to share was the tier three talks. The tier three talks is something that I am implementing, well, I've implemented at Malcolm X and uh, Craigmont schools, as you can read on the screen, that it provides targeted services to students and families that cycle in and out of crisis. In the past eight years I've had in this role, I've had four families, a total of 12 children extracted from their families and placed in foster care. Uh, what I've been able to do or exercise from my wheelhouse is um, my county range. And so through that county range, I was able to identify point people um, in charge of the care of these children and case managers and bring them into the school and engage them uh, with school community stakeholders and other clinicians in a way that is authentic to the family. Um, from this, uh, we were able to sit down and problem solve uh, and get the family support both at city and county level. To this day, my record is four and oh. Uh, we have uh, all four families that were extracted have been returned to their families. Um, and um, I just wanna talk just briefly about one of the wins, well, a couple of the wins that I have. Um, I now do basic needs drives for both of my schools. I've been doing it for about eight years. Um, John Muir is now doing, John Muir has always uh, done a basic needs drive because I was the former coordinator for their, for that school, but now Malcolm X and Craigmont collaborate on basic needs drives. Um, and I'm not really sure if anybody knows how Pantry got here, 
but pantry is uh, an activity or a resource that I brought to the district. I brought that to the district in collaboration with both uh, John Muir and Malcolm X PTAs, uh, partnership with the City of Berkeley Aging, Aging and Elders Program, along with a food partner. Um, and we've moved from the backpack program to bags being delivered by task rabbits to now a family choice pantry that will be happening in the fall. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, our next examples come from BAM and Rosa Parks. Uh, Nabet is our OFI liaison specialist at these sites. And, and these were some of the examples she shared with us and the team. I do want to point out specifically that Nabet goes really above and beyond. Um, she does, in addition to the, the, the family specialist uh, component, she, she actually provides translation services as well as needed, not just for her schools, but really throughout uh, the district and other teams do reach out to her. Um, and she you can see she's helping coordinate um, some of the CSA space that's the uh, for our disproportionality. So she's working really closely with the school and ensuring that those academic needs are being met and supported um, in that cost structure in meeting with families and I, those identified students. I'm gonna share this one as well. Ramona McCreary is our specialist who is at Ruth Ackley and also serves on the district office. And she shared a couple examples of the work both at Ruth Ackley, but also the role she plays with central office. Um, she has supported, helped support the Berkeley High team as well. That's Irma Parker and Leticia Mesqua. I think Leticia is, might be in the audience listening. So we thank them for the work that they've been doing. Um, Ir Irma Parker is uh, a longstanding member of this team in this district um, who is back at home recovering from some knee surgery. So we wish her well, and she'll probably be back with us soon enough. Um, but just some further examples of how this team is really integral to the support of our families and really bridging the gap for um, some of our really neediest families. I'm gonna turn it over to Lily Howe. Lily is with us here and she's at Emerson and John Muir. Yeah, thank you for um, having us tonight. I, like Ruben said, I'm Lily Howell. I am at Emerson and John Muir. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things um, that are on this slide. I think first and foremost, it's important to talk about why we um, care so much about basic needs. So, you know, basically taking care of basic needs serves our family's hierarchy of needs. If you don't know where you're gonna eat tonight, or if you're gonna sleep in a slave, safe place or have clean clothes to send your kids to school, you're, um, you know, you're, you're gonna have trouble engaging. But if we can fill that gap, then you're already positioned to engage in and prioritize more with the school system. And so I think it's really important to highlight the work we do with our community partners and our PTAs to support these basic needs of our families. And it, it really is family engagement, um, fulfilling these needs and serving these needs of families. The other thing that I just wanted to highlight, and you've heard it over and over again tonight, is that belonging and voice are so, so important, right? Um, for our families and our students who feel the racial alienation of our currently gentrified Berkeley, you know, creating a sense of belonging is really invaluable. So feeling welcomed, feeling community um, and belonging enables families to engage on a deeper level, to be in attendance meetings, to be at SSTs, to be at IEP meetings, to be involved in the PC, PTA, SSC, parent-teacher conferences and communication. And we build these trusting relationships with families um, that begin to create a sense of belonging in the schools and can really bridge to wider belonging within the schools. But often we're that first step or that first touch on building that welcoming belonging space. Um, and that bridge really works two ways as well. We also bring family voice and perspective into school leadership um, meetings, into cost meetings, into SPED team meetings, into staff meetings, conversation with leadership. Really everywhere we go, we're trying to elevate family voice. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight really quick that we have also run a student advisory committee at um, Emerson with the principal, Jana Holmes. And I just wanna elevate that because it's also an opportunity where we've um, had to have a very representative group of students 
EL students, SPED students, McKinney-Vento, racially diverse, that brings student voices to the question of equity in schools. And I know we heard that earlier tonight about how students actually experience our schools. And we found that really important to ask our fourth and fifth grade leaders what they think of equity in the schools. And then we've brought that voice back to the cost team and the staff meetings and had them lead discussions um, in the classrooms. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Lily. Um, I'd like to introduce Carol Perez, who's going to speak to the work at Oxford and Washington. I know you're here, Carol. I see you. I think you need to unmute. Good there you evening. are. <laughs> thank, thank you all for having us tonight. Um, as Ruben said, my name is Carol Perez, and I am a family engagement and equity specialist at Oxford and Washington schools. I've been in the district since 2013, more or less. Um, so I'm also a parent. I have two children at Berkeley High. Some of my other coworkers are also parents and that kind of informs us for this work in working with families. Um, and I feel like uh, race, relationships and partnerships based on trust are the key elements of our work, as has been said by my coworkers. We partner with families, school staff, district staff, and community organizations so that all of our students can experience success in school. While we haven't quite reached that goal yet, our commitment to culturally responsive practices in our schools and at the district level um, helps us to intentionally break down some of those barriers. And what makes this work really rewarding for me are the students who give me hope, the families who keep me humble, the community members who push me forward and my coworkers who keep me grounded. I want to thank, I want to take this opportunity to thank some of the com community partners like the Berkeley Public School Fund, Berkeley Holiday Fund, Berkeley Food Network, City of Berkeley, and the East Bay Community Law Center who really stepped up and assisted our families during this pandemic and really helped us um, serve the community. And also a big thank you to all of the individuals and families that made financial contributions to our school PTAs and the Berkeley Public School Fund that also has been a tremendous help for our families. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, our last member presenting this evening with us is also one of our newest members to the OFI staff and group. Uh, I wanna welcome Alejandra Frias. Um, and she is at Sylvia Mendez and also supporting central office efforts. Um, Alejandra, are you there? I know yours is brief, but you're, I'd just love for you to come on board. Yes. Hi. Good night, everyone. Thank you for allowing us the space to discuss um, our efforts. Um, I am fairly new, so a lot of my focus has been in individual family care, which includes the Berkeley Food um, Pantry that we do. Um, we started a community closet at Sylvia Mendez, which has been very successful. Um, many families do contact me um, for various basic needs. Um, and actually, um, Sylvia Mendez goes through very unique challenges due to the dual immersion program. And so there are many families in need um, with a support with um, the Spanish uh, materials for, for parents that do not speak Spanish. Um, and so that has been a, a huge gap um, since the pandemic that we need to address. Um, in addition, um, we have partnered also with Pique and the Project to Inspire to help um, parents become leaders and involved in how to um, encourage students uh, to learn more about the A through G requirements and to go to college. Um, and just in general, I do wanna say that one of the challenges that I have faced um, so far is because of the pandemic, so many of the resources that Berkeley used to have before is no longer there. And so we've had to now revamp a lot of these places um, and contact many of these 
uh, institutions and reach out um, to various areas to make sure that we have a more, um, uh, how do you say, like a more um, present um, viable resource. Thank you, Alejandra. So President Brown, I'm looking at the clock, it's 1056. Um, we were going, we had originally planned to stop and do questions, but do you want me to stop sharing my screen? Do we need to extend the meeting before I finish this next section or do you want me to try to finish the next section in three minutes? Um, I don't think you can finish in three minutes with the questions that we have. Um, so <laughs> go ahead and uh, stop sharing your screen and we'll go ahead and um, call for a motion to uh, extend the meeting. Wow, no one's no one's even. Well, um, President um, Brown, let's see, we have we have this, and then um, the action item. I assume will be quick, right? Because it's it's kind. Of, well, I don't know. Anyway, I don't. No, I don't um, think the action item will be quick because I'd actually like to discuss it or table it. Okay. Sorry, so how much what, time? Is what is your what is your pleasure? It has to be done in the motion. So we have two. It sounds like a couple proposals for motions on the floor. Is there someone who can offer a formal motion? Well, I'm sorry, President Brown, Associate Superintendent. How much time do you think the rest of this will take? This this um, discussion item. I can do the next or the remaining slides. I I can probably present those in five minutes and then would be open for questions from the board. Uh, and questions will probably be about 20, 25 minutes or so. Oh my God. Can, I, can, we, um, go ahead. can I move to um, extend the meeting to 1020 and table the action item to a night? Okay. Um, is there, is there 1120? 1120, I think you mean. Is there a second? Yes, 1120, thank you. I'll second. Is, is her motion, her motion is just, the, we can only do the extension, right? Or I can't hear you, Director Sinai. Her, her, I'm sorry, I, she had two things. She talked about an extension and a table, but are we just doing the extension? Vice President Babbitt's motion was to extend the meeting to 1120 to, I guess, account for the questions and the remainder of this and then to table the action item to another meeting. So that's the motion on the floor. We need to take action on the motion on the floor. Can so, we discuss it, President Brown? Well, I, 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 so this is how it works. There's a motion on the floor. There's a second, I seconded it. When I call for unreadiness or the question, oh. that's the opportunity for discussion. Then after that, we will take the vote. Okay? I've been wanting to declare unreadiness ever since you started saying that. Well, this is your opportunity. Is there any unreadiness? I'll call for the question. I have some unreadiness. Um, can I, uh, before tabling this action item, I would ra I would rather discuss it because I don't know how staff feels about it. I don't know what the implications of tabling it would be. Um, so, so I would I would rather we extend the meeting, you know, till eleven forty five and and give us time to actually discuss it because um, I don't, I don't know what would it, what it would mean to table it. So you I, have I, to ask the original motion maker if um, it sounds like that's an amendment to the motion. So you'll have to ask the original motion maker if um, she will receive that amendment or offer another, just receive the framework amendment or offer another one. Can I make a substitute motion, President Brown? Well, can I just uh, clear, ask, answer your question? Can we yeah, just sure. get to the next meeting, which is only two weeks away, and that will actually give me time to discuss my uh, my comments and my my unreadiness on that action item with staff further, uh, which I'm well, not the only one who shares that unreadiness. So I don't, as you saw how long that strategic planning went on, I don't want to have to do this at, at late night if we could be fresh. Um, I, if, if I could offer my own unreadiness, I think what um, Director Alper was saying that um, the other thing that Director Alper was saying was around um, the opportunity to discuss it instead of an action item. So does that impact uh, your motion on how do we agendize it for the next meeting, Vice President Babbitt? 
I, I it's eleven twenty. I mean, I would like to table it. It can be an action item or a discussion item the next time. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, I think that was Director Upper's question. No. I no, thought my, he wants to discuss it now. No, I, 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 can we ask Dr. Stevens or Associate Superintendent Raley, like what the, if it's just two weeks and that, that makes no difference um, and we just discuss the next meeting, then that's fine. But a lot of times when we have positions that we've post, that we want to get posted, um, it, it matters. Two weeks matters. Yeah, Associate Superintendent Raley. So this, this director position is a repurposing of an existing director position that's currently vacant. So partly why I'm doing an OV presentation is because I'm serving in that capacity with OFI. Two weeks from now or now, a decision on that director job description isn't going to make that big of an impact. So I, I can live with that. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I'm looking at the hour. I do want to finish. I, I have my OFI staff waiting. Because I want to ask the OFI staff a question. I, I really want to get through that. But if it's two okay. weeks from now, we're, we're going to take up the director job again. That's fine. What I'm about to share in the OFI, though, is part of the reorg structure that does impact the director position. So we can discuss okay. that as well. As okay, that's fine. I just want, I appreciate that. I just want to make sure we weren't going to be hurting ourselves in the filling of that position. I'm fine with Director ba uh, Vice President Babbitt's motion. Okay, so Vice President's motion still stands on the floor. It's been seconded. Um, all in readiness has been identified. Ms. Barrios, can you please call the roll? President Brown, who seconded the motion? I did. Okay. Um, and we don't have our student director with us? And doesn't look like it at the moment, so. No, she had to do homework. It was, it's 11. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Director Sinai? Yes. Director Vasudev? Yes. Director Alper? Yes. Vice President Babbitt? Yes. President Brown? Yes, thank you so much. The motion passes. Now we can continue with the presentation. I am so sorry you all uh, for, that, for that pause, but thank you for, um, for allowing us to take care of the business that we need us to take care of. No. Associate Superintendent? Yes. So I'm, so I'm, not, I'm we're going to just do questions. I'm going to get through this and then we'll do questions instead of breaking it up because I, I want to honor the time. But what you're looking at here is a proposal essentially for a reorganization um, within educational services. Now, OFI is now under educational services. That was a, a movement of the OFI office, that department under ed services, which is why I've assumed sort of the leadership role with the team as is. Um, so what we're looking to do is a repurposing of the director of OFI position, which is a current position in, in our books, in our budget, and creating a director of equity, achievement, and belonging. We heard both earlier in this meeting through our presentation with, with Dr. Fisher and Kamaro Gwynn, um, really just this need for bringing these, these items under one umbrella. Um, so you, what you're seeing is essentially a proposed org chart um, with the Director of Equity Achievement. You see that there is OFI. I have highlighted here that we have an OFI supervisor position. This position technically is still in our budget. Um, that position exists. Um, this would be now thinking through for next year. Um, we know that there are budget implications if we were to keep both a director and a supervisor. Um, so that's something that we would have to discuss um, further. But this department would hold and support, there'd be true management of some of these resolutions like the Black Lives Matter resolution, the Latinx resolution, um, really bridging both the engagement side, which we know is critical and important, to the academic side of the house with the ed services, seeing true collaboration. And now my dogs are about to bark. I do apologize for that. Um, so I'd like to bring in also the RTI staff underneath this director and the work of the African American Success Project Manager in the MOJA, sort of under one large umbrella. One thing, and so sort of this is part of the, those strategies why we want to prioritize, and this just kind of repeats some of the things I've just shared. I did um, ask specifically around the OFI supervisor position, because that is a, a piece that we I'd like to hear from the board, some guidance, which is some pros and cons around that position 
position continuing to exist in this structure with the director position. And we've listed them here. As you can see, there are a lot of pros uh, for why to keep this supervisor position. And I'm not gonna read those to you all. Um, you also have access to the slide deck. Um, when we know one of the biggest cons that's coming up is obviously there's the funding implications of keeping both a supervisor and a director, um, but specifically the team um, listed a lot of these pros and why we'd want to keep this position. And that is the end of the slide deck. So I would like to take the opportunity to get questions and comments from the board at, while the OFI staff is still here. Thank you so much. Um, OFI staff, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for what you shared. Thank you for staying here late until the evening. I'm gonna talk really fast because we only have a, a few more minutes and I know the rest of the board directors have questions, but thank you just for all that you all, um, for all that you do. I know it, it probably isn't said as much as it needs to, um, and we don't always get the opportunity to say this to you all publicly. So thank you for your work. Thank you for the ways that you make for all of our students and families. Okay, now on to our questions. Vice President Babbitt. Uh, yes, I'd also like to thank um, all of you so much for your hard work on this presentation and definitely for the work that you do with our families and the work that you do to improve our school communities. Uh, you are an invaluable resource to our families and we celebrate and appreciate you. I would like to um, ask that um, Associate Superintendent Aurelio that you would check back on the next steps from the last board meeting um in their presentation because there were significant um follow-up actions that were already in place uh specifically around parent workshops across the district um, and at individual school sites um as for me as a parent those parent empowerment workshops made the difference and in so many ways and to have um OFI staff to be able to uh, be in meetings and to help navigate the, the school systems and conflicts with parents and teachers and principals. Those are all invaluable resources. So I want to make sure that we um, prioritize and highlight that work as well. And um, lastly, I want to. Um, oh, you can come back. I'll, I'll, somebody else may say it. And I don't do you... I won't take it off. <laughs> I don't know if anyone from the OFI staff uh, of around parent workshops, and I think Vice President Brown, you're referencing the presentation from last school year. I think it was around May, correct? That OFI did it's about a yes. year ago. And, and I we talked the about the next steps. About the next steps. Um, tracking as far as making improvements. Oh, I'll just go ahead and say it now. Um, with the with the pros for the uh, supervisor position, um, can make sure that I, I go to the SBAC committee meetings, the superintendent's budget advisory committee meetings, and I don't think they get to hear that. And so it often stays on the cut list of recommendations. And there really isn't anyone there advocating for, um, for OFI in general. Um, so I think it's important that the SBAC is aware of the, uh, the staff's need or request of the pros for the supervisor. Thank you. Point. Thank you. Vice President. Uh, Director Sinai. Thank you. I will be um, quick. I just want to thank you all for being here tonight, being here so late tonight, and particularly all the work you do with our families. I think you are the the, the, the Director Sinai. We can't metaphor. hear. You. I can't think of my metaphor. You're the, you know, the link in the chain or whatever that really helps make sure that our families are connected. So thank you, thank you, thank you. My one question is similar to the question I asked um, uh, to uh, Mr. O'Gwen and, and Dr. Fisher and the team is, what do you see as um, things that happened during the pandemic that you, you think we, you're afraid we might lose, like whether again, it's the linkages with um, services that we provided. I, we know that there's increased need around social emotional support, but I'm just wondering like, if you were to say, I don't wanna go back to status quo. Here are some things that I think from our experience in our school sites, that would be really valuable for us to think about if you have ideas around. 
I think Jocelyn, you raised your hand, so I'm gonna let you jump in. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to say thank you, Director Sinai, for that question. I think what, um, what we found was that there were so many families underserved and under the radar. Um, and those families, um, they stick out like sore thumbs now. What I don't want to do is get on a track where there is communication fatigue like uh, Kamara was talking about. And so um, even with my tier three talks, we get the family to come in and tell us what their societal issues are. And, and we get together as cost teams and tier three um, clinicians really, and we talk about ways to problem solve for the family. What we're gonna do next determines the trajectory of that family. We need that conversation to stay on the table. The other thing that needs to happen is that the resources that are in the city and the county, district and site level need to talk. We don't talk, those pieces don't talk. Um, I have been consulting with the Berkeley Public Health Nurse around this same thing. And we both came to the consensus that Berkeley and other communities through this pandemic will benefit from a community health network. I would like to keep those conversations on the table, keep the needs of the families in the front. Thank you, I love that. We keep the needs of the family in front. Director Vasudev. Thank you so much to the OFI team for being here. And I really love what you just said, Ms. Foreman. That's music to my ears. It's um, how do we work? Because I know the impacts of the pandemic are going to be felt for a long time. So this idea of us uh, just working together on the public health front and building those bridges is so important. So thank you for saying that. I um, am really grateful just to hear directly from the staff. I know there was a lot of conversation last budget season about the boots on the ground, and here we are, Director Sina, the boots of the, on the ground are here. And so I'm just thrilled to hear directly from our OFI specialists. Um, I'm really pleased too with the, I just wanna echo the comments that uh, Vice President Babbitt made, very grateful to the, just the different kinds of parent empowerment series, particularly the multilingual series with um, Project to Inspire and with Beke. Thank you so much to the district we're hearing that feedback last year and really working and you know there's always more work that we can do with our multilingual family so I'd love to see a parent empowerment series in Arabic you know in the future um, but I think it's so important that that we're improving right like let's give ourselves a shout out for improving and also um, you know we don't have to have uh, this discussion tonight but one of the discussions that maybe within the context of the director level discussion that we're having later that I think would be kind of interesting and I asked this last time in May too just about Ophi like do we have a menu of services that we offer to all sites, right? And we don't, we can entertain that discussion like in the future, but that's something that I, that I still, um, for me is still kind of unanswered from the comments that were made in May that I made in May last year that I think is really important. And I, and I say this as someone who oversaw the Safe Routes to School program and with SFUSD, and that's something we developed is the menu of what are safe food services for all SFUSD schools. And then for those deep dive schools that need more support. So, so a school like Longfellow may need more support, right? So like, um, what are what are those services and do we have a consistent menu and what's the con, you know consistent family engagement model that we're using so um, we can table that discussion for the future but um, I'm all ears from the specialists too if they have any thoughts about that but thank you for staying so late with us Vice President Babbitt Okay, well, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Longfellow's Family Engagement Full-Time Coordinator. It was one of the resources that we expanded this year to have a full-time uh, middle school family engagement officer, which has been amazing. And uh, Principal Furlon has recognized him with a certificate of um, acknowledgement for getting $75,000 uh, brought to Longfellow Middle School, uh, specifically related to Title IX and making sure that all of our families are enrolled. Um, he's supported the admissions office greatly and making sure that all of our uh, fifth graders who want to come to Longfellow were enrolled timely, as well as transitioning to eighth graders. And I know this is work that all of you do, and so we thank all of you for that 
uh, for just helping to manage all of those processes that we really need to improve and streamline as a district. And so we would also appreciate that feedback of those additional paperwork uh, challenges that we put so many of our families through, especially given uh, you all know that the stories, you all know the times that they spend, you all know the hardships that they are facing as well. And so I definitely look forward to working on that um, as best as I can as a board member through policy just to make sure that we can streamline and impact those processes as well. And um, yeah, and, and once again, just uh, thank you to our uh, superheroes as Berkeley Public Schools Funds recognized you all as last year. Thank you. Um, we have about three more minutes until uh, the end of our meeting. Uh, Ms. Howell and Ms. Perez, I see your hands are up. Um, Typically, when you're a, a presenter, you can just go ahead and jump in and respond uh, to the question. So please feel free to do that. You want to go, Carol? <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to address the, um, uh, I think it was um, Director Sinai's question around not repeating the status quo. And I feel like one of the things that was really um, important that we learned is the importance of partnership with um, our staff, our school site district staff and the community. Um, and really looking at where our students are at and where our families are at. I mean, we have a lot of students who were not at grade standard prior to the pandemic. And you know, we all have an idea of what happened since then. And I feel like our community and our staff really are wanting to take this on and come together and figure out the next steps. And so that initiative and that heartfelt drive, I think we need to capture and move forward with. Um, and also in terms of the uh, workshops, um, several of us have been getting together to talk about workshops for families and what that would look like. And these are discussions that we've been having for years, really. And we have done some over time. Um, to be quite honest, uh, I feel like we have been on a whirlwind um, during the pandemic trying to meet the need. And it's just the need is much greater than the resources. But now that things are slowing down a little bit, it does give us some time to kind of go back to the plans that we had initiated years ago and start really looking at what those workshops would look like. And the idea of listening sessions of like, let's you know go deep with our families to find out what they would really like to um, see us do as far as workshops and leadership, you know, the key, at, part of that, uh, the workshops and the education is to develop our family leaders um, so that they can take that on as well. And I'm glad that someone talked about a model for OFI. That would be awesome. I'd love to work with folks on that. And just a model on what family engagement means for our district. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Ms. Howell, I know um, you had your hand up 15 seconds. Do you want to share? I was just going to say that the pandemic really illuminated so much of, of our students and they had such a divergent experience that I think we had a year of some kids completely opting out and reeling them back in. Um, I think relationship is the best way to reel those students back in. So we need to continue to invest on those relationships and that social emotional piece for those students to engage them in curriculum. I mean, we have so many students who barely did school and for them, it's been a really hard transition back into the school building. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you all so much uh, for this presentation. Again, for staying here until almost 1130 at night. Um, and for all that you do for, for our students and for our families. So thank you, Ofi, and have a good evening. Uh, we will now, since we still have things to on our agenda and we've moved our action item, uh, but we will now take the second and last opportunity for public comment. Um, if there is someone who has a public comment, this is a perfect opportunity to raise your hand. Going once, going twice. 
Great, no one has raised their hand for public comment. And so now at 1120, our meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.